Hi there, I'm Lindsay Sparks, author of the Echo Trilogy. I just wanted to pop in here real quick to let you know that if this is your first of my audiobook videos, uh, then you need to stop, go back to the first book in the series. This is the second. Not only is this the second book in the series, this is the third part of the second book. So go back to the first book, Echo in Time. The link is down in the information and um, you want Echo in Time part one. I also just wanted to mention for those of you who are returning, uh, there are still ads in this part of the audiobook, um, as there will be continuing forward. I hope you enjoy the conclusion of this book of the Echo Trilogy. Part 6 Netgerat Oasis, Sixth Dynasty, Old Kingdom. Chapter 32 Wives and Children. I stared at an enormous and rather unremarkable rock outcropping, wondering if, once again, something had been lost in translation. Maybe the word I'd thought meant oasis actually meant huge mesa. Personally, I preferred my translation, and I really hoped it was still, somehow, accurate. I wasn't built for desert excursions. Under my protective linen robe and cowl, I was hot, sweaty, and pretty ripe, and I'd been looking forward to glassy pools surrounded by palm trees where I could take more than the barely useful sponge baths I'd grown used to over the past week and a half. Hearing that the rocks ahead were, in some way, supposed to be the Netgerat oasis had been a needle to my hopes, poking them and causing them to deflate in an instant. Heru was walking beside me, as usual, and was silent, as had become usual. The cold shoulder mixed with his near-constant close proximity was exhausting, and I'd had enough. It was time to break the silence. Plus, I needed some clarification on the whole oasis thing. I said as much to Heru, adding, So tell me, how is that the Netgerat oasis. I studied his profile as we crossed the final stretch of windswept sand separating us from the mammoth rock outcropping, along with the rest of our Negere human and donkey caravan. Heru continued looking ahead. The rocks surround the oasis in a ring, like a protective wall. He sent me the briefest sideways glance, and whatever he saw in my face... A thousand shattered dreams, a you-kicked-my-puppy expression, absolute and utter disappointment, something along those lines, caused him to chuckle. I do not wish to spoil the surprise, little queen, but do not fear. You will not be disappointed for long, I think. I pursed my lips and narrowed my eyes. I hope you are correct, Haru. I really do. When we'd crossed half the distance and were several hundred yards away from the tall wall of rock, a dark sliver came into view, an opening in the wall's face. The closer we drew, the taller and wider it seemed. Only when the first set of people and pack animals reached the opening did I realize just how big it was, wide enough for a half dozen people to walk side by side and at least twice their height. I figured Nguyen was in that first group, as he'd taken the lead almost every day, while Heru seemed to prefer bringing up the rear. At the moment, only Aset, Nakure, Denai, and the other priestesses were behind us. Russ, who'd been sleeping in his little sling, snug against my chest, awoke with a squeaky meow yawn and proceeded to stretch with such intensity that his little furry body shook. I pulled out the collar of my robe, peeked down at the kitten, and spoke to him in English. Hey, little guy. He stared up at me with sleepy, squinted eyes and yawned again. I think you're gonna get to stretch your legs soon. Maybe chase some bugs. How's that sound? He started purring out loud. Over-enthusiastic purr that belongs solely to kittens. It wasn't my words that were making him so happy. It was the hand I'd tucked under the layers of pale linen so I could scratch under his chin. 
but you have to promise to leave the scorpions alone, okay? His eyes closed, and he tilted his chin back, stretching out his neck. I'll take that as a yes. We were nearing the opening in the wall of rock. It was too symmetrical to be natural, and inside, the walls and floor were far too smooth. My heart rate picked up as my excitement made a resurgence. A nice, polished tunnel through a wall to somewhere was a lot better than a giant, solid rock. You speak with little Russ quite often, Heru said. I glanced at him. Well, I have to speak to someone. It was an unnecessary jab, and I wished I could suck the words back in as soon as they flew out of my mouth. I was far from companionless. A set, Nakure, set, deny, the priestesses, Nguyen. But the one companion I desired above all others was out of my reach, and I knew he had a pretty damn good reason to hold me at arm's length, even if, with every breath, I wished he would pull me close, hold me tightly, and promise to never let me go. Heru didn't respond. He did, however, take hold of my arm and pull me to the side of the tapered opening before I could enter the tunnel. My hasty words must have irritated him as much as I'd feared they would. Apologies, Heru, I know the situation is difficult. He led me closer to the rock wall and stopped, stepping in front of me and watching the final few stragglers disappear into the tunnel. After a quick nod at someone behind me, he pushed his cowl back, and all of his attention was focused on me. Those molten, golden eyes stared down at me, that chiseled jaw clenched. Those high cheekbones seemed sharper in the afternoon light, making him appear more wild and fierce and ancient, more other than usual. His appearance was a stark reminder that even now, thousands of years in the past, it had been a long time since he'd been human. I fidgeted under the intensity of his stare, pulling both of my arms into my robe and petting Russ. I met Heru's eyes, but looked away almost immediately, growing irritated at my deferential reaction. I forced myself to lock gazes with him. What? What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? Shaking his head, Heru let out a heavy sigh and almost smiled. I would speak with you now, and I would have you say nothing until I am finished. My eyebrows rose. Heru pushed back my own cowl, and I squinted as I lost the only thing shielding my eyes from the sunlight. He trailed the backs of his fingers over my cheek before pulling his hand away. It had been days since he'd touched me, outside of training, and his fingers left behind a trail of tingles on my skin. I swallowed roughly, doing my damnedest to hide my reaction to that simple, restrained touch. My heart was racing, but I kept my breaths as even as I could. There is much I would have you understand of my life here, of my life in general, and why the choice you have given me is such a difficult one, he said. But I fear that much of what I have to say will upset you, and whatever you may think of me, upsetting you is the last thing I want to do. I could think of one thing he wanted to do less, bond with me, but I held my tongue. A humorless smile curved his lips. Ah, but... I see you do not believe me. He shook his head again, laughing softly. I cannot say I blame you. And now I shall risk driving you away completely. But I would have there be honesty between us, however bitter that honesty may taste. I pulled part of my bottom lip between my teeth, and Heru's eyes flicked lower for the briefest moment. Honesty... I wasn't sure it was something we could have. Not completely. I wasn't sure if I could tell him that Nguyen would die before I left this ancient time, or that Set 
would be possessed by Apep, and the possession would last millennia. And then there was the whole twins issue. How would he react to finding out that thousands of years in the future, we would had to have children, and our children wouldn't exactly be normal? I'd already turned his life upside down. I wasn't sure either of us could handle any further upsets. Not yet. Heru cleared his throat. My other two wives, they are here, as are our children, and many of my aging human descendants from past unions. I would have you meet them. Have you learned something of the sacrifice I, and others, would be making, should you and I truly be together? I was shaking my head before he'd finished speaking. There was no reason for him to give up any kind of relationship with his children, and where his wives were concerned, as much as it pained me to admit it, relations with them would return to normal as soon as I was gone. It would be as though I'd never existed in this time. It had to be that way. But I stopped myself and squeezed my eyes shut in a protracted blink. Please continue, I said, and reopened my eyes. The faintest hint of a smile turned the corners of Heru's mouth upward. Many Nijirat men value human women for one thing alone. Their ability to bear our children. He paused, his stare turning challenging. I am not among them. I only take wives I genuinely care for. I genuinely desire. And I love them as best I can during the short time I have with them. He did smile this time. A sad, wistful expression. Their lives are so fleeting but it is that very quality that helps me remember that every day matters, that every moment deserves my full attention. As he spoke, I realized that while I still felt extreme, wrenching jealousy toward every single woman he'd ever been with, I also felt gratitude toward them for helping to shape him into the man I loved so desperately a man who'd been hardened by time, but who wasn't oblivious to its passing, like so many of the ancients of our kind. His eyes searched mine. Bunifer has been my faithful wife for fifty-seven years, and in that time, she bore me eight children. Five survived to adulthood, the youngest of which manifested two years ago. She is the first child of mine to do so in over a century. Bonifer is quite elderly now, and though our relationship has changed over the years, I still hold great affection for her and consider her one of my closest friends. I will mourn her passing for centuries. His eyes shone with the love he felt for Bonifer, and tears pricked in my own eyes. I believe she will like you very much. She and Aset have always been very close. My eyes widened. And then there is Seshaset. He exhaled heavily. Sesha is... Well, she is much like you in many ways. Pensive, guarded, filled with single-minded determination. He smiled, and for once... The expression touched his eyes, and quite beautiful. We have been together for nineteen years, and during that time she has given me six children, four of which remain with us. He paused, but his eyes never left mine. I would have you stay in my home, with my family, with me. Stunned, I opened my mouth, but couldn't seem to find any words. All I could manage was to slowly shake my head. Stay in his home? With his family? His wives? I have already spoken to Nguyen about this, and he is amenable. So long as you are. You would have your own private sleeping chamber. But this would also give us a way to come to know each other better. To understand how our lives 
and the lives of my family would be changed if we bonded. Again, he paused, and the skin around his eyes tightened minutely. What do you say? Are you willing to try this? I inhaled and exhaled several times, pondering how to respond while I studied every angle, every line of his face. On my fifth inhale, I did the unthinkable. I nodded. Very well. I am willing to try. Relief filled Heru's eyes and visibly altered his stance. His shoulders relaxed, his chin lowered, and his lips curved into a genuine grin. What did I just agree to? I adjusted Russ's weight in his sling, anxiety already rising. I wasn't ready for this, for meeting them. I felt the desperate need to delay and said the first thing that came to mind. But I would like to clean myself up before you take me to meet them. There is a small bathhouse in my home. We could... Before I meet them, Haru. And I need to fetch a fresh dress. He didn't miss a beat. Your priestesses will no doubt be waiting for you on the other end of the passageway, in the oasis. We will gather a clean dress from them before sending them on to my home with your belongings. I felt my eyes go wide and my heart flutter wildly. This was all happening too fast. But... And then I will take you to a small secluded pool where you may bathe under the sun and I shook my head feeling my chest tighten with rising panic Heru I Bunefer and Seshachet will love you he said reaching up to run his fingertips along my jaw and down my neck curling his fingers around the back of my neck and though his eyes were usually filled with a gleam of repressed longing when he looked at me he was now letting the emotion show in his open expression. My breath hitched. And my children will love you, he said, so very softly. Part of me expected him to declare his own feelings, to put my mind at rest by telling me, once and for all, he'd decided to bond with me. It was the selfish, hopeful, and apparently delusional part of me. Ever so slowly, he leaned in, bringing his face closer to mine. His lips brushed across mine with the faintest pressure, just enough that I could feel them curve into a smile. I was afraid to move, afraid to breathe, afraid to do anything that might shatter this moment. Heru pulled away just as slowly, the slight smile still curving his lips. Come little queen. He stepped around me, pausing at the mouth of the tunnel and looking back at me while holding out his hand. I maneuvered my left arm through the folds in my robe until my hand was free. Tentatively, I approached Heru and placed my hand in his. He grinned, his eyes crinkling at the corners and his irises sparkling with genuine pleasure. I'd never thought of the skin between my fingers as an erogenous zone, but the slow, sensual way his glided between mine changed my mind completely. His grin turned sly, knowing, and just the tiniest bit wolfish. Oh, he knew exactly what he was doing and could read the effect he was having on me clear as day. Even though he wasn't bonded to me, I was still fully bonded to him, and that made even the most benign touch feel decadent and rouse more than a hint of desire. Heat flooded my neck and cheeks, even as things low in my abdomen tightened in misguided anticipation. I licked my lips, unable to break eye contact with him. Heru's pupils expanded, dilating with desire that mirrored my own, even if it was paler on his end due to our one-sided bond. His eyelids slid closed, and he inhaled deeply. He said a word I didn't know, but based on his harsh tone, I assumed he was cursing. When his eyes snapped open, his irises were almost entirely black. Just the thinnest circlet of gold surrounded his pupils. 
You enjoyed teasing me in my time as well, I said, allowing a small smile. I raised my chin a little. Be careful, Haru. Your self-control may be strong, but it is not limitless. His eyes narrowed, holding a glint of challenge. Perhaps you overestimate my desire for you. I cocked my head to the side and barely held back a smirk. Mutual desire was one thing that had never been lacking between Marcus and me. And Haru, being a younger Marcus, well, perhaps. But I do not think it would be a wise theory to test. Heru pressed his lips together in a thin line and made a rough noise low in his throat. Perhaps you are right, he said, starting toward the passageway and pulling me along beside him. Perhaps. Chapter 33 Over and Over As we plunged into the shadowed tunnel, I couldn't help but laugh. Just as my heart couldn't help but beat too quickly, cooler air enveloped me and I sighed in relief. Shade, like water, was a rarity in the Sahara, and I basked in the momentary lack of sunshine. Up ahead, the other end of the passageway was a point of brightness that expanded quickly as we walked. Through it, I could see sunshine and greenery and, as Heru had predicted, the silhouettes of three women, the hat whore priestesses who'd all but begged to stay with me, despite claiming to believe that I wasn't actually their goddess. I still wasn't completely convinced. I couldn't see much beyond the shield of date palms and low, desert shrubs that sprouted a few yards beyond the tunnel's exit. It was almost like they'd been planted there on purpose, to block unwelcome, unexpected visitors from catching a glimpse of whatever lay beyond them in the oasis. Knowing Nguyen and his slight flair for eccentricity, I figured the Necherat homeland would be populated by structures at least as unique as the people who inhabited them. I nodded to myself, certain that the thick shield of palms had been placed strategically. As Heru and I emerged from the passageway, Denai smiled and bowed her head. We will accompany you to Nguyen's residence, Alexandra. I am sure you wish to bathe and rest. Her eyes slid to Heru, lingering on our joined hands, and she arched an eyebrow. And you must wish to return to your home, Heru. However loyal she was to me, she didn't wholly approve of all the time I spent with Heru. I thought it was less because I was being potentially unfaithful to my husband and more because of Heru's past relationship with Unkinson Pepe, who Denai seemed to despise, as did almost every other woman I'd spoken with, aside from Nguyen's primary human wife, Ipwet, who I tried to avoid as much as possible. I offered Heru a weak smile. Actually, Denai... I will be staying at Heru's home. Denai's face transformed, going from disapproving to flabbergasted in an instant. I choked on a laugh, coughing and barely holding back a grin. I just need a clean dress. Straightening her back, Denai held her head high. I see. And what of us? Where would you have us stay? Heru cleared his throat. You are more than welcome to stay in my home as well. The corner of his mouth twitched. That way you can continue to protect Alexandra's virtue. Denai ignored his barb and returned her attention to me. She'd relaxed, and the usual good-natured sparkle had returned to her eyes. Would this please you, having us remain there with you? Very much, Denai. I scanned the two other young women, Sia and Kemi, and smiled. Very much indeed. And I meant it. I was nervous as hell about moving in with Haru. Two of his wives and his brood of kids, and having the priestess's familiar faces around would do a lot to ease my nerves. Plus, I simply enjoyed their company. They were loyal, trustworthy, and kind women I'd come to consider close friends. 
Sia, who as soon as I'd requested fresh clothing had started rummaging around in a bundle attached to one of the three donkeys lounging nearby, handed me a rolled up dress of fine white linen. A moment later, she added the belt Denai had made from some of the turquoise and quartz beads that had come from my destroyed bead net dress and my pair of turquoise and gold embellished leather sandals. Kemi fished through another bundle, pulling out a jar of the paste that passed as soap in this time, a mixture of natron and ash, very similar to what I used every morning and evening to clean my teeth. I accepted the offerings with a smile and murmured thanks. Are you certain you do not want to accompany us and wash up there? Denai's hands were on her hips, and she was making a really valiant effort not to eye Heru suspiciously. Yes, Denai, I am sure, I said, laughing softly. I would like very much to make a good first impression. She sighed dramatically. Very well. We shall inform Heru's wives of your imminent arrival, and aid them in setting up our quarters. She bit her lip. But I hope you will not take too long. She will take as long as she takes, Heru said, tugging on my hand as he stepped toward a downsloping, palm-lined path that ran along the rock wall. My kitten chose that moment to start kneading my chest. I slipped my hand free of Heru's, earning raised eyebrows and parted lips, and looked at Denai. Will you take Russ? I'm certain he is starving, not to mention dying to run around. Denai grinned. She loved the little furball almost as much as I did. We made the exchange with a lot of help on her part, considering everything I was holding, and I gave her my thanks before rejoining Heru. He watched me with guarded eyes as I approached. I stopped in front of him, studying his face, and trying to puzzle out the reason for his sudden reticence. Behind me, I could hear the priestesses and donkey making their way along another of the paths, leading away from the mouth of the tunnel. So, where is this pond you mentioned? Heru continued to stare at me, a million thoughts seeming to whirl around in his eyes. Heru? I touched my fingertips to his forearm. Is something wrong? Exhaling. He shook his head. I thought, he cleared his throat. For a moment, I thought, perhaps, that you changed your mind, that you would choose to stay at Nguyen's residence instead. I have never felt so. Again, he shook his head, his brow furrowed. It does not matter. He took hold of my hand once more, the gentle slide of his fingers between mine just as sensual as it had been before. Come, I will show you the most perfect hidden pool for washing. You will love it, I think. At this point, a tub of water behind a boulder would have looked like the most perfect hidden pool for washing. I snorted as he led me down a path lined with limestone, reaching up toward the clear blue sky on one side and a mass of date palms and shrubs on the other but my mouth fell open as we rounded a curve and the secluded hideaway came into view. Heru had brought me to a small spring, surrounded by limestone boulders that seemed to have been artfully arranged around the water, and the tiniest burbling waterfall trickling into a wide pool that glittered with sunlight. It really was the most perfect hidden pool, it looked like it had been relocated from some fairy tale land into the heart of the Sahara. How is this real? I said, laughing in wonderment as I stared around. He'd been right. I loved it. And if it was any indication of what the rest of the oasis was like, I was almost tempted to forego washing up in favor of getting a good look at the rest of the place. Almost. I tore my eyes away from the delicate waterfall and looked at Heru. It is perfect. This place. He smiled, genuine pleasure gleaming in his eyes. Releasing my hand, he reached for the items I was carrying and set them on a low, flat boulder beside the pool. And then he returned to me, 
and started unwrapping the thin fabric looped loosely around my neck. He tossed what had been my cowl onto the ground before taking hold of the sides of my multi-layered linen robe. My hands found his wrists, gripping them tightly as I held them in place, and I looked up into his darkening eyes. What are you doing, Haru? He raised his eyebrows, feigning casual unconcern, but nothing could hide the desire, the challenge in his eyes. I am merely helping you disrobe, so you may bathe. Staring at him, I held his wrists for a moment longer, and then I let go. My robe, more a sun and heat protectant than anything else, was pulled over my head and had joined the cowl on the ground within seconds. I stood before Haru in a thin, white linen shift that had been clean when I donned it that morning, and the supple leather slippers I'd been wearing throughout the eleven-day journey, wondering if he would attempt to remove the rest of my clothing as well. He took a step backward and started attending to his own overlayers. They landed on the rocky ground beside mine. But he didn't stop there. He towed off his own hide moccasins as he worked on unknotting his linen kilt. I couldn't move, couldn't tear my eyes away from him. I could barely breathe. Watching him was the only thing I was capable of at that moment. My breaths came too fast, like I was doing something strenuous instead of just standing there, staring at him as he undressed and loving every single nanosecond. Not that he seemed to mind. His eyes never left mine. Never judged. Only promised. At least, I hoped they promised. He dropped his kilt on top of the pile of discarded linen garments and stood before me, completely nude, and he said nothing. He watched me watch him watched me taking in the sight of him. His expression went through a play of emotions, starting with curiosity and eagerness, only to move on to excitement and desire, to need. His chest, like mine, was rising and falling too quickly. Alexandra, please. His voice was hoarse, asking, demanding, returning my gaze to his, I removed my shoes, then crossed my arms in front of me and gathered my shift at my hips. I pulled it over my head in one smooth motion, eternally grateful to the priestesses for being so gung-ho about hair removal. The ancient Egyptians were not fans of lice and made sure to eliminate as many habitats for the little buggers as possible. What had been a few moments of stinging pain led to a shorter, if more memorable, moment of absolute glee the gleam in Heru's eyes as he scanned me, his body's response. At this point, I was ready to kiss all of the priestesses I was so grateful. I raised my chin and squared my shoulders. Oh, he definitely seemed to enjoy that. Are you going to get into the water? Heru's lips twitched as his gaze heated. After you... He held out his arm toward the crystalline pool. Smirking, I shrugged and showed him my backside, slowly making my way to the pool. It was nothing he hadn't seen before, or rather, wouldn't see later. The water felt heavenly, the perfect Goldilocks temperature, and I groaned as it reached my hips. My smirk grew when I heard the water splashing behind me. I stopped when it was waist high but didn't turn around. Perhaps you were right about my self-control, Heru said, his voice rough. Perhaps? The water lapped against my back as he moved closer. Perhaps that is your intention. Laughing, I shook my head. Bathing here like this was your idea. Do not presume to blame me. Suddenly, Heru's hand was on my hip, sliding to my stomach, and the front of him was pressed against the back of me. And damn me to an eternity of torture by a pep set, 
if I didn't almost lose myself to pleasure in that moment. I could be so pathetic sometimes. But I do blame you, little queen. His breath was hot against my ear, just as he was hot against my backside, making the water feel cool in comparison. I blame you for invading my every thought, my every dream. I blame you for making me desire what only you can give me, more than I have ever desired anything from another being, Netjerat or human. His other hand slipped up my ribs until he cupped one of my breasts. I gasped as his finger pulled and twisted tender flesh without mercy. I blame you for making me want to know your mind as much as I want to know your body. I reached behind me, taking him in hand and savoring his sharp inhale as my thumb slid along his hard length. I closed my eyes, thinking nothing had ever felt so good. I was so very wonderfully wrong. Heru's hand glided lower on my abdomen, moving completely underwater, finding my most sensitive places for the first time. I gasped and moaned in his hold, and for minutes, he did the same in mine. It was the most intimate we could be without actually initiating full-on bonding. Hero, I reached up with my free hand, hooking it around the back of his neck. Hero, you have to stop. You have to stop this before it goes too far. You stop it, he said, his voice barely a rasp, and I melted completely. Pleasure overwhelmed me, and, based on his sudden rigidity, overwhelmed him as well. For dozens of breaths, we stood in the water, clinging to each other, until finally our bodies went limp and boneless. I arched my back against him as I felt his arousal resurge and forced my fingers to unclench from around him. Let go, Heru. What? This will continue over and over again. You must let go. I squirmed in his hold, flailing a little. This is... I've never... How long does it go on? It never stops, I said. He still held me, my body tensed, my muscles ready to flee. His voice was barely audible when he spoke. Never. I shook my head. How do you handle it? The one thing. I laughed hoarsely. How do you think? There was only one thing that made it bearable, and it was the one thing he wasn't ready to give me. His answering groan, his clenching hands were enough to make me melt all over again. We should finish washing up, he said. Yeah, I rasped. We should. Chapter 34 Can and Can't Do you feel better? Heru asked as he rewrapped his linen kilt around his waist. I nodded and wrung out my hair one final time, then pulled my clean shift over my head. Remarkably so. Thank you. His hawk-like gaze burned into my skin, and I averted my eyes while I affixed my belt around my waist. I wish you would not look at me like that. In what way am I looking at you? He finished tying the inner ends of the kilt into the intricate knot men of this time used to keep their pants up. My lips curved into a wry grin, and I glanced at his face. Like you were imagining what it would be like to truly be together? His eyes heated even further. But I am imagining what it would be like. My cheeks flushed. I was fairly certain my whole body blushed. Again, I looked away, focusing on the pile of dirty linen, and cleared my throat. We should gather our things, and in three long strides, Heru was in front of me, his hands gentle under my jaw, tilting my face upward. His eyes searched mine. 
I was imagining what it would be like to be inside you, and I was imagining what our life might be like in your time, as to be unified, as a man and woman can be, to have our livelihoods intertwined for all eternity, to have chosen that. I... I licked my lips. With Nguyen's shoot, I have been improving my control over memories. I bit my lip. I could show you some of my memories of us, if it would not seem too strange to you, I mean. I could see in his eyes that he wanted to say yes, wanted to experience what he could of our future together, but he shook his head. I will stick with imagining, for now. Oh, I looked down at the rocky ground. Heru slid his hand down my neck, over my shoulder, and down my arm to twine our fingers together. Come, little queen. I am eager for you to meet my family. He grinned, but there was a hint of worry in his eyes, probably because there was more than a hint in mine. And I know that you are eager to see the rest of the oasis. I finally managed to return his smile. Heru led me back up the path, to where we'd split off from the priestesses and through an overlapping break in the date palms. It gave way to a narrow walkway paved with what I thought was brick-shaped paving stones arranged in a zigzag pattern at first, but they glinted too much in the afternoon sunlight to be stone. Heru, I said as we stepped onto the pathway, my eyes glued to the ground, the paving stones are made of ought. And then I looked up, at the way ahead, and my mouth fell open. Stretched out before me was a small city of graceful, opalescent buildings, composed of elegant domes and arches and sleek columnades and spires, all gleaming in the bright sunlight. There were other, smaller and boxier structures that appeared to be made of regular limestone bricks, clustered around the more grandiose buildings. Palaces. They must be palaces, along with copses of tall date palms, as well as small orchards of other fruit trees. But those elegant, shimmering buildings, they were like something from some distant, alien world, almost too beautiful to exist here. I shook my head. It is all made of art. I glanced at Heru but quickly turned my attention back to the walled-in city. Each palace appeared to function as the center of its own little neighborhood, surrounded as it was by a starburst of the more mundane buildings, as well as orchards and gardens. From my vantage point, it seemed that each neighborhood merged together to form a cityscape more awe-inspiring than any cityscape of my own time and weaving a sinuous path through it all was a sparkling stream crossed by bridges lined with railings of aunt filigree. I did not know such a thing was possible. Again, I shook my head. Did you know what it was? That it was constructed from aunt? Heru shrugged, giving my hand a tug to move me forward along the path. I knew that Nguyen had built it long ago before I was born, but until I met you and saw firsthand the wonders a wielder of shoot is capable of, I did not know how he had built our people's home or what he had used to make it. I stared at the fantastical palaces juxtaposed with more ordinary structures as we neared the edge of the first cluster of buildings. There was a single palace of Ott, smaller than some and larger than others, and what appeared to be a well-tended orchard and garden surrounded by dozens of the smaller stone buildings. This is where my family resides, Heru said, pointing ahead. He shifted his arm, indicating the highest-reaching Ott Palace, at least a half mile off to the left. That is Nguyen's residence, in the center of the oasis, and near it is a bridge I think you will find quite beautiful. He looked at me, 
his lips spread into a broad grin. After you have settled in, I will show you everything. Father! It was a high-pitched shriek. It's father! Father approaches! More high-pitched shrieks joined the first as three small children emerged from a narrow alley between two of the stone buildings and sprinted toward us. The youngest was a girl who looked to be around four years old, the oldest, a boy, around nine, and the other, a girl, somewhere in between. They all had black hair and bronze skin, just like their father, and they were all ridiculously adorable. Heru released my hand as the smallest flung herself at him. Laughing, he picked her up under her arms and swung her around, seeming to revel in her squeals and giggles. When he stopped spinning, she wrapped her tiny legs around his waist, her arms around his neck, and buried her face against his shoulder. He patted her back gently. Meeting my eyes for a moment before the other two kids reached us, they too practically attacked Heru with hugs, though their feet remained more or less on the ground. The elation, the pride, the love that had shone in Heru's eyes in that brief moment when he looked at me was seared into my memory. It stole my breath and made tears well in my eyes, my heart desiring something I'd never yearned for before, something that, until a week ago, I'd thought was an impossibility. For the first time, I truly wanted this with him. A family. I wanted our family to be a real living thing. And it would be. It had to be. But not yet. Not for thousands of years. I think you have been gone too long this time, husband, a woman said, and the children have turned rabid. The voice was rich and a little husky. My attention shifted away from Haru and his trio of children, and I watched a woman approach from the same alleyway. She had dark hair that she wore longer than was fashionable, cascading in waves over her shoulders, and she was more handsome than pretty or beautiful, and she was very, very pregnant. She called Haru husband. My mouth was suddenly as dry as the desert surrounding the oasis, and my heart beat too heavily in my chest. His wife, pregnant, their children. I swallowed thickly, unable to stop thinking about what we'd just done back at the pool and feeling like a conniving homewrecker. Heru had been right to show me this, to show me them. He'd been right to do so before we did something that couldn't be undone, at least not while I was still in this time. His wife was pregnant. Sisha, Heru said, extracting himself from his kids and setting the little girl on the ground. He held his arms out to his wife, cupping either side of her face in his hands and bending his head down to brush his lips against hers in a brief, tender kiss. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't find enough oxygen in the hot air, and I couldn't tear my eyes away from the expecting parents. Jealousy and shame and self-disgust consumed me. Heru moved his hands down to his wife's rounded belly and smiled. I did not know you were with child again. But she is, another woman said. Her voice was raspy and weakened by age. She hobbled closer, hanging on the arm of a strapping teen boy who was unmistakably another of Heru's sons. And you did not listen last time, but you must now. This will be her final child, husband, unless you wish to send her to the gods before her children are grown. Heru's glee evaporated off of his face, and his hands fell away from Seshachet's belly. He looked from her face to the old woman's, who I realized had to be Bunefer. There have been problems. Yes, Bunefer said, as there were last time, though much worse. She shuffled a few steps closer and stared up at him, 
waggling one arthritic finger under his nose. No more, Heru. You know what you must do now. Please, Bunefer, enough, Seshaset smiled kindly, and her eyes settled on me. We have a guest, and there is plenty of time to discuss these matters later. Oh, yes, I forgot. Bunefer hooked her arm through Seshaset's, and together they ambled toward me. I could feel my eyes widening, my heart racing. I wasn't sure I could actually talk to them, not now that I'd seen her, seen how gentle and loving Heru was with her. I was worried she was that awful Netgerat woman who has been clawing at Heru for ages, Bunifer said to Seshaset, squinting her cloudy eyes at me. I wasn't sure she could actually see anything. Even with the way those Hathor priestesses were going on about her, well, I cannot tell. Is she? Seshaset laughed softly and shook her head. No, Bunifer, she is not Onkins and Pepe. Thank the gods. Both women stopped a few feet in front of me, Seshaset's full lips spreading into a smile once again. I am pleased to welcome you into our home, she said, bowing her head a little. I, I, I looked into her warm brown eyes, then over her shoulder at Heru. His face was a mask of wariness, like he could sense what I was about to do. I am sorry, I blurted. I cannot do this. Turning on my heel, I took one lurching step after another until I was all out sprinting away toward the only sanctuary I could think of, Nguyen. I was about halfway there when Heru caught up to me. He took hold of my arm and dragged me into a small copse of squat date palms. His expression was filled with so much concern, so much torment. What is wrong, Alexandra? He shook his head, staring down at me with liquid gold eyes. I do not understand. I tore my arm free of his hand and, without thinking, slapped his face. How dare you? How dare you turn me into some, some sleazy? You do not understand. Seshashet is carrying your child, Heru, and she welcomed me into her home. Me, after what we just did. I looked up at the clear blue sky. I have never felt dirtier in my entire life. Marcus would never ask me to do this, would never put me in this position, never make me feel like a whore. I leveled an angry glare on him. You may be a younger version of the man I love, Heru, but you are not him. Heru stared at me, stunned, holding my head high, despite wanting to collapse onto the ground and weep. I turned away from him and marched out of the copse of trees. I wore mental blinders the rest of the way to Nguyen's, not seeing people or buildings, and with each step, I felt more and more despicable. Chapter 35 Will and Way Nausea roiled in my belly, regret curdling on my tongue. I'd spoken rashly, lashing out like a wounded animal, and the words I'd thrown at Heru, however much I regretted them, could never be unsaid. True, I could make him forget them, but doing so would have made me an even more despicable person. When I reached Nguyen's place, I found my husband standing out front in the dead center of the largest of five gracefully curved archways, his hands clasped in front of him, and a pleasant smile curving his lips. My hurried pace slowed as I approached. I climbed up three shallow, broad steps and threw myself into his arms. What have I done? I bemoaned against his shoulder. I knew Nguyen had heard. He heard everything. You were hurt, dear Alexandra. Nguyen rubbed my back gently and rested his cheek on top of my head. 
I'm sure that all will work itself out. Just give it some time. I sighed heavily, swallowing the urge to whine about how I wanted things to work themselves out now. Several days ago, you and Heru spoke about creating something to leave behind for the future Heru to find, Nguyen said, changing the subject as he pulled away. I was eternally grateful. I believe I have just the thing. It will, what is the saying in your tongue? Kill two birds with one stone. You will leave something for a future Heru and expend some of the built-up energy from my, your shoot, thus prolonging your life. Nguyen captured my hand. I started the project years ago, before I knew all of the details of who would end up carrying the burden that is now yours, and it has been sealed up ever since. He guided me around the corner of the palace to a circular patch of soft sand that appeared to be some sort of a rock garden. In the center of the garden stood another ought building. This one looked more like a tiny temple sanctuary, much like the hot hor inner sanctuary back in Mennefer, except there was no obvious entrance. We stopped before the face of one smooth outer wall, and Nguyen released my hand. You must unmake the door, dear Alexandra, he said, holding his hand out toward the wall. It was well over head height and as wide as three people. My eyebrows rose. But I've never handled that much aught before. Nguyen waved a hand dismissively. The big things are easy. It is the tinier amounts that are harder to manage. All you must do to maintain control over the physical art is touch some part of it. Unblock your access to the shoot you hold within you, like I taught you, and try it. You'll see. Brow furrowed. I frowned, but I didn't argue. I let down the block inside me, stepped forward, and touched my fingertips to the solidified ought, closing my eyes. I thought, unmake. The ought softened until it felt almost liquid against my fingertips. I opened my eyes and pulled my hand away watching the quicksilver mass dissolve into a colorful mist before it evaporated completely. And in its place was a wide doorway, displaying a broad set of stairs, also made of ought, that led downward, underground. Nguyen brushed past me, descending the stairs, and I followed. Enough daylight spilled in through the wide doorway behind us that the chamber at the bottom of the stairs was dim though still visible to my Nezuret eyes. It was about the size of the average modern living room, and the walls were covered with neat columns of hieroglyphs, but they were slightly different from any I was familiar with. More ancient, I realized, giving Nguyen a sideways glance, and a rectangular ot altar had been erected in the center of the space, waist high, just the right size for a person to lay on. Nguyen reached the foot of the stairwell ahead of me, and I jogged the last few steps to reach for him. He looked over his shoulder as my fingers latched around his arm. You created this to be your tomb, didn't you? I said, glancing at the altar. There was a reason it was just the right size for someone to lay on. Because it was meant to hold a body. He smiled his favorite, mysterious Nguyen smile, and pointed to three false doors, creating impressions in the opalescent walls ahead and on either side of what could only be called a burial chamber. You must leave my words unharmed, but you may expand through each doorway as far as you wish. Ah, uh, I gave him another sideways glance. But we're underground, wouldn't I have to dig into the ground first? You know, so there's space to put whatever I build? Doing so would take ages. Nguyen shook his head. As the art expands in this plane, 
It does not displace matter, but replaces it. I narrowed my eyes. That doesn't make sense. Matter can't be created or destroyed. It's a thing we know in my time, a universal law of physics. Nguyen frowned and cocked his head to the side. I said nothing of creating or destroying. But you said... Nguyen turned to face me and rested his hand on my shoulder. Think of it like this, my Alexandra. When I first created the door that had been sealing this chamber, the matter that had been there, the different atoms making up the air, transformed into solidified art. And when you unmade the door, the solidified art reverted back to the types of matter it had originally been, in the exact state it had been in when originally transformed. It is as though you are transposing that alternate plane onto this one, but only in a delineated place. And while the art matter is here, whatever it is displacing is frozen in time. I shook my head, getting it and not getting it at the same time. Clearly, a Nezuret does not a physicist make. I cleared my throat and pointed to the false door on the opposite wall from the stairwell. So, do I have to hop into the ought to grab more raw material, or can I just use what the door's made from? Nguyen's face lit up. Very good, yes. You can be so bright sometimes, my Alexandra. I eyed him, totally confused. Um, simply touch the door and unmake the portion of solidified art you wish to unmake. Then will it into whatever new shape you wish. More art will be pulled in as needed, without additional guidance from you. It's really quite intuitive. Just think of what you would like to happen, and it will happen. He held up a finger. So long as you're touching the alt. All right. I made my way around the altar and stopped in front of the false door. I raised my hand, touching my fingertips to a portion near the edge. Here goes nothing. Honestly, I just hope I didn't cause the whole underground chamber to come crashing down around us, or to be unmade, leaving us encased in earth. I shuddered and took a deep breath, forcing myself to concentrate. I pictured a simple room, about the same width as the burial chamber and twice as long, but with an arched ceiling instead of a flat one. I figured I might as well toss some architectural variation in to amuse myself. I felt the solidified ought liquefy and readjust, slowly expanding outward. The earth didn't shake, the ceiling didn't shatter, I simply continued to picture that arched room, gleaming with its opaque, quartz-like walls and floor. Oh, oh dear gods. The voice was husky and female and definitely not Nguyen's. My eyelids snapped open as I set the ought with a thought, feeling it solidify into a smooth, cool surface under my fingertips. I turned around slowly hoping I'd misheard, but I hadn't. Sesachet stood on the bottom stair, her elbow linked with Asset's. Both women's eyes were wide, but Sesachet's mouth was hanging open as well. Ah, uh, I looked at Nguyen, hoping for guidance. Only a select few had ever seen me use my borrowed powers, including Asset, and we'd intended to keep it that way. It was why I was extremely careful about where I practiced using the chute, and why the block shielding my power and my glowy rainbow eyes remained up at pretty much all times. If a pep discovered that Nguyen was no longer at full power, if he learned that I, a mere Nezuret, held the chute. I think I need to sit down, Seshaset said. Asset helped ease her down to sit on the second-to-last stair, but 
Seshashet continued to stare at me with wide eyes. You are a true goddess. Is this why you have rejected my husband? I shook my head, taking several steps toward her. No, I am... She is, and will continue to be, Nguyen said, and I shot him a surprised look. For a while, in time, she will return to being a regular Netgerat, like Aset or Heru. You cannot speak of this, Seshishet, of what you have witnessed. Not to anyone, not even Bonnefer. Seshishet blinked slowly, and I was pretty sure it was the first time she'd blinked since seeing me work my magic. Of course, I will speak of this to no one. Aset cleared her throat daintily and addressed Nguyen. Seseshet wished to speak with Lex, great father, in private. Ah, yes. Nguyen walked past the altar and started toward the stairs with a nod. Very good. He held out his arm to Aset, who accepted resting her hand on his forearm like a dignified Edwardian lady, and together they ascended the stairs and left me alone with Heru's pregnant wife. I glanced around the underground chamber, searching the inscribed walls for some hint of what to say. I didn't find a single thing. Sesachet laughed quietly. It was a soothing sound. I apologize for my reaction just now. She shook her head. It is only I have never seen the like. I exhaled a weak laugh. Not many have. Smiling, she patted the stair beside her. Please, sit with me. I would speak with you about your relationship with my husband. My stomach soured, but I couldn't bring myself to deny her request. She deserved my cooperation after what I'd unintentionally done to her, attempting to steal away a man who wouldn't be mine. Not really, for over 4,000 years. Right now, he was hers. I moved the rest of the way around the altar and sat beside her on the step. It is complicated, loving him, she said. Watching her out of the corner of my eye, I shook my head. Complicated didn't even come close. But I believe you already know this. Her smile widened a little. In the village where I grew up, it was not a normal thing for a man to have more than one wife. She met my eyes, a sparkle in hers. Or a woman to have more than one husband. But my village was near Menefer, and the Netgerats and their ways are well known there. She paused. One day, Bunefer walked into my father's villa and demanded to see me. She was hunting for Heru's next wife. She told me, since she'd been unable to be a complete wife to him for many years, and he'd refused to search for another. I shook my head. A complete wife? They had not lain as husband and wife, because doing so would risk Bunefer becoming pregnant. Her last child died before it was born, nearly dragging her into the land of the dead as well. A wistful smile spread across Sashashat's face, and I was starting to think she rarely went without a smile of some kind. Bunefer was so petite, but so dignified. I was in awe of her. She told me she needed to find a woman who could keep Heru away from the, I apologize, Netgerat whore in Menefer, and make him want to return to the Netgerat oasis on a more permanent basis, to be with his family. I frowned. Seth Sachet's tale was not painting the prettiest picture of Heru's character. 
As I came to know him, I learned that it was Nguyen, not Ancus and Pepe, who was keeping Heru away from the oasis and his family, and it was the duty he felt as Nguyen's blade that kept him in Menefer so long as Nguyen was there. What did you do? I spoke with Nguyen, requesting permission to be an annoying shadow to Heru, day and night, to ensure Kessie had no chance to corner him alone. Sassachette nodded. It surprised me how pleased I was to find that Heru never ordered me away, and only laughed every time she was put off by my presence. And then one night, there was a knowing glint in her eyes, making my stomach lurch. I swallowed a burst of jealous nausea and clenched my jaw. I was with child not long after, and Nguyen ordered Heru to take me to the Net Gerard oasis and to remain here until I'd borne him three children. She sat up a little straighter and started rubbing her bulging belly. He did not leave again until I'd given him five children. She sighed. But now it is too dangerous for me to continue being a complete wife to him, and he must find another. She met my eyes. Or, at least, a Netgerat woman who will love him and care for him in ways that I no longer can, not merely wish to use him to gain more power. After a deep breath, Sashashet said in a rush, I came here to ask you to reconsider becoming a part of our family. I stared at her. My eyes opened wide in surprise. The priestesses who serve you adore you, as does Aset. And now that I have seen how truly powerful you are, I know that you would never use Heru for self-serving purposes. For once, her smile slipped and her gaze bored into me. You will love him and support him and be a true partner to him in a way that only one of your kind can be. You must do this. You must keep her away from him, from our family, I beg of you. I opened my mouth, then shut it again when I realized I had no idea how to respond. Sessa Shed reached for my hand. There was fear and desperation in her eyes. You do not know how horrible she can be, what she is capable of. Shaking her head, she squeezed my hand. Please, at least consider it. I shook my head slowly, recalling the last things I'd said to Heru and feeling sick to my stomach. Sessa Shet, call me Sesha, please, she said. Sesha, I cleared my throat. It is not that I do not wish to try to be Heru's true partner, but that I think it may be too late for us, at least in this time. I said something cruel to him, something unforgivable. Sessa Shat furrowed her brow. I have not seen him since he ran after you, but I will send the children out in search of him, and when they find him and bring him home, I will speak with him. I am certain he will understand that you did not mean what you said, and all will be forgiven. She squeezed my hand again, her eyes searching mine. You will be here. I shrugged, then nodded. It wasn't like I had anywhere else to go. Not really. Sessachet started to stand, or at least tried to stand. I hopped to my feet and helped her up and when she patted my hand, letting me know she was fine, I let her go. I will send him to you, here. She smiled her increasingly familiar, warm smile. I do not think it will be too long. But I didn't share her confidence. I accompanied her to the top of the stairs, not completely convinced of her ability to balance. She looked like she might topple forward at any moment. A set appeared in the doorway holding out her arm to Sesha Sat and looking at me. 
No one left to attend to something. I do not know what. Concern shone in her eyes. But he told me about your argument with my brother. Fantastic. Are you all right to be alone? Do you want me to return after I accompany Sesha home? No, no, I'm, I'm fine. I lied. I wasn't fine. But I also didn't want to be around anyone. When my mind was troubled, solitude was my preferred coping mechanism. Very well. Asset studied my face for a moment before turning to walk away with Sesheshet. I watched their retreat until they rounded one corner of Nguyen's palace and were obscured by a series of delicate columns, then trudged back down the stairs to study my new creation more closely. It was the only thing I could think of doing that had even a remote chance of distracting me. Deny and the priestesses visited after a couple hours, bringing me food and lingering around the mouth of the stairwell, but I didn't invite them down to what I'd started to consider my private sanctuary. Set stopped by as well, and after him, Nikure, with a wineskin, which I didn't turn away. I sat with Nikure on the outer steps as the sun dipped behind the western rim of the cliffs, walling in the oasis, neither of us saying much. I found unexpected comfort in his silent presence and appreciated that he didn't feel the need to corrupt that silence with words. The evening passed without any sign of Heru, and by the time full dark blanketed the oasis and I was once again alone in my sanctuary, I sat on the floor, my back against the smooth ot wall, and spoke to Marcus the only way I could. I inscribed my words on walls that I'd willed to glow, telling him about what I'd experienced so far. I was just starting to describe our eventful trip to the marketplace when my eyelids drifted shut and I slumped against the corner of my sanctuary, sound asleep. Chapter 36 Give and Take I came awake with a gasp. The semi-opaque walls of my sanctuary still glowed with a gentle incandescence, and there was a crick in my neck from sitting curled up in the corner for so long. But none of that mattered at the moment. Somebody else was in my sanctuary. I could hear the intruder descending the final few stairs into the altar room. I held my breath. The colors of the ot mist curled around me, preparing to whisk me away to safety. But I didn't want to retreat. I wanted to fight. This was my place, my haven, and someone else, some intruder, was violating it. A not-so-tiny, not-so-quiet part of me hoped it was Ankins and Pepe, so I could have an excuse to see how well my exhausting training with Heru, Set, and Nakure was paying off, and beat the crap out of her. I grinned, and the ot mist surrounded me in a burst of rainbow colors, I exited time and space, only to re-emerge in the altar room a few yards away, directly behind the intruder. As I reformed, a mere thought brought an ought blade into being in my hand. I pressed it against the front of the intruder's neck. A man's neck. At the same time that I pressed myself against his back, his spicy scent filled my nostrils. Hero, he was my intruder. He grunted, his fingers wrapping around my wrist. Do it, Alexandra. He pulled my knife hand closer to his neck, forcing the blade to slice into his skin. The pain will be a relief compared to that caused by your last words to me. You want to hurt me, so do it. No! I shrieked, unmaking the knife, maintaining his hold on my wrist. Heru twisted around to face me. The full moon bathed the side of his face in shadows and silver, while the soft iridescent light spilling through the doorway to my sanctuary made the other side seem to glow from under his skin. He took a step forward, pushing me backward. He took another, another. 
My breaths were coming faster. What are you doing here? When my butt hit the edge of the altar, my heart gave an extra enthusiastic thump. Heru stared down at me, his eyes just as shadowed and silvered by the combination of diffused moonlight and glowing ought walls as the rest of his face. His jaw clenched, and his nostrils flared once. He was so close, only inches between us. I took a shaky breath. Did... did Sesha talk to you? Is that why you are here? His eyes tensed, and he shook his head. Why that made me feel relieved was beyond me, but it did. I followed you, he said his voice quiet and silken. I watched you with Nguyen, watched you come down here. I watched Sesha and Oset and Denai and the others visit, watched you sit with Nekure under the moon. There was a sharp edge to that final observation. Tilting my head to the side, I narrowed my eyes. Did you listen when Sesha was here? I did. He glanced around, but only for the briefest moment. Little sound comes out of this place, much like how it is in the other buildings constructed from the art. But I did hear. None of my wives ever believed me, but I have never been intimate with Cassie. I find amusement in taunting her, like a trained cobra, but I would never let her close enough to bite. Even I... I'm not so ruled by my baser instincts that I could overlook her poisonous nature. My eyes widened. I'd been so sure about his relationship with her. So sure. I shook my head the barest amount. These weren't lying eyes. My wrist, still held in Heru's almost painful grasp, was the only thing separating us, and it felt as substantial as a brick wall and as flimsy as air. If you do not believe me, he said, then tell me to go. Say what you said earlier. Tell me you meant it, and I will go. Sucking in a breath, I parted my lips. You may be a younger version of the man I love, but you, Heru, are not him. I would never repeat those words, I wished I could erase those words from existence completely. Tell me, he repeated, his eyes searching mine. Tell me and I will leave you alone. He held his breath, tension tightening his expression. Leave me alone? I shook my head, feeling the sting of tears. I didn't want him to go, to leave me alone. I didn't ever want him to do that. Not in any time period, not in any place. Closing his eyes, Heru exhaled, and his almost pained expression melted away. Shakily, I raised my free hand and touched my fingertips to the side of his face. There was a hint of rough stubble. I brushed my thumb across his full lower lip, tantalized by the dual silk and sandpaper sensations on the pads of my fingers. You are trembling. Heru said, his eyelids slowly rising. Despite my loose linen dress, I felt like I was wearing a corset. My chest didn't seem to have enough room for my heart and lungs to cohabitate in their suddenly hyperactive states. Heru leaned his cheek into my hand, then turned his head to run his lips back and forth over my palm. The sensation tickling and tingling was almost too much. Almost unbearable, I sucked in a ragged breath. I have decided. His gaze locked with mine, heated and demanding. No more imagining. Licking my lips, I repeated his words. No more imagining. The words were simple, but their meaning was so clear that us uttering them created an immutable verbal contract between us. We would bond in this time, in any time. Heru leaned in until our lips were a hair's breadth apart, but he didn't close that final distance. Instead, 
he made a rough, pleased sound, low in his throat, and angled his face lower to run his nose along the line of my jaw. Your scent intoxicates me, he said, pressing a feather-like kiss to the skin just under my ear. I can only imagine how you will taste. My heartbeat stumbled over itself. No more imagining, I somehow managed to say, though the words were breathy. I twisted my wrist free from his grip and moved my hands down to the front of his linen kilt. And no more waiting. Heru moved in that faster-than-humanly-possible way that was born of a combination of his negere physiology and centuries spent honing his body's reflexes. He captured both of my wrists and pushed them away from his thighs with infuriating ease. His eyes glinted with challenge and promise, with desire. Taking our time, he shook his head slowly. That is not the same thing as waiting. It is savoring, and I intend to savor every inch of you with my hands. Those hands were sliding up my arms, over my shoulders, and back down the sides of my body until they gripped the linen on either side of my hips and pulled my dress up and over my head with my lips. Those lips were curved into a sultry, taunting smile. With my eyes. Those eyes skimmed down the length of my body, their focus a searing brand on my skin. And with my tongue. That tongue slid over his lips, wetting them with sensual promise. And only then, when I know your body better than I know my own, will I take you. That challenging glint flashed in his eyes again. And I will take you, little queen, over and over and over again. I swallowed roughly. My chest rose and fell, rose and fell, rose and fell. My heart galloped, each beat pounding against my sternum. Lifting my chin and squaring my shoulders, I met Heru's challenging gaze with one of my own. I had no problem with any of his tantalizing promises, save for one. I wouldn't remain sane much longer if the ache of wanting, if the bond's mounting need to be completed, wasn't sated. And soon, he could have his fun, do his savoring after. And because I was as familiar with his body as he promised to become with mine, I knew how to get my way. I knew his weaknesses. I knew exactly how to push him to the brink of control, to fan his need to an undeniable level, just as he'd already managed to do within me. Too quickly for him to stop me, and some of my borrowed power may have been involved, I dropped to my knees, shoved the linen of his kilt up and out of the way, and took him into my mouth. All the way. He sucked in a breath. His fingers suddenly tangled in my hair. He seemed to be caught between pulling me closer and trying to push me away. I looked up at him, into his blazing gaze, and let him see just how much I was enjoying savoring his body. I was shocked that he let me continue for as long as he did, let me remain in control for as long as he did. But when he did stop me, he made it very clear which of us was truly in charge. With a hoarse growl, he gripped my upper arms and lifted me until I was sitting on the edge of the altar. There was the sound of fabric tearing, and then he was standing between my legs, his arousal hot and hard, pressing against me. He claimed my mouth as he entered me, neither his kiss nor the joining gentle. The single, urgent thrust shattered the pressure welling inside me, and I threw my head back and gasped, riding swell after swell of explosive pleasure. Sheer physical relief washed over me, almost as enjoyable. Tension left my muscles in waves, tension I hadn't noticed until it was gone. Apparently, being around Heru 
even experiencing our fleeting dalliance in the pool. None of it had been enough, and the toll of not being intimate with the man who was quite literally mated to my soul had been snaking through my body, creating fissures, widening them, and slowly tearing me apart. But not anymore. Now I was whole. There was only peace, blissful peace. Haru seemed to understand how badly I needed to bask in the nearness that came with such a joining, to satiate our broken bond. He wrapped his arms around me and simply held me against him for minutes while I gave in to the sensations caused by my fractured soul being slowly pieced back together. When my breathing grew more regular, I raised my head and met his eyes, giving him a lazy smile. He brought his hands up to my face and wiped tears from my cheeks. I have never seen pleasure make someone cry such tears. Laughing softly, I shook my head. It was more from relief than from pleasure, I think, though there was plenty of pleasure. He arched an eyebrow and slowly shifted his hips away from me. Was plenty of pleasure? He thrust forward without warning, earning a grunt from me. His eyes traced over my face as he repeated the motion, studying my responses closely. If it is gone away, then I must chase after it. He increased his pace, his force, but his eyes never left my face. I will chase your pleasure until I catch it again, and I will never let it go. Either he stopped talking or I stopped listening. It didn't matter either way, because he didn't have to chase either of our pleasures for long. Sensation swelled inside me until it was too big, too full, too much, and then I was overflowing, not just with ecstasy or relief, but with something that eclipsed mere physical pleasure. My ba merging with his, our souls intertwined more deeply than our bodies ever could, uniting us in that single moment of eternal bliss that made everything else feel, smell, taste, and sound muted in comparison. I became fully aware of the universe in these moments, and oddly enough, never cared one bit. Marcus, Heru, my bondmate, became my whole universe in these moments, just as I became his. Breathing hard, Heru stared at me as his ba untangled itself from mine, settling securely inside his body. His eyes were wide with wonder. I had no idea it could, that bonding would be so. He shook his head. I have no words to describe it. I laughed weakly, not because I wasn't ecstatic, but because it was the most my temporarily spent abdominal muscles could manage. I doubt there will ever be words that can describe it. Heru's gaze changed, his eyes darkening with some heavy emotion. I just hoped it wasn't regret. He raised his hand, grazing his fingertips over my face, and my eyes fluttered closed, and then he spoke words that nearly shattered my heart. If I asked you to stay with me, to live out the years between our two times by my side, would you? There was nothing I wanted more than to have a chance to grow and change over the millennia with him, to truly be his equal, the partner he deserved. But that could never be. My chin trembled, and clearing my throat, I shook my head. I cannot. You know that. He rubbed a slow, languorous line back and forth over my bottom lip. Because of the shoot, I nodded. But if there was a way. There isn't. But if there was, would you? I sighed, but it came out as more of a sob. I wish, more than anything. I shook my head, knowing that wishes never solved anything. I love you. I will always love you, in any time. Is that not the most important thing? 
I dislike that you must carry such burdens. Haru's fingertips continued to trace slow, gentle lines over my face, like he was trying to memorize what I looked like with touch alone. I didn't think he even realized he was doing it. I dislike that the Great Father has put you in such danger. I dislike everything about this situation. I captured his free hand and pressed his palm against my chest, just over my heart. I do not think you dislike everything about this situation. Heru breathed out slowly. Forcing a lopsided grin, I moved his hand a few inches until it was cupping my breast. What about this? I gazed up at him through my lashes. Do you dislike this? His eyes narrowed. Or this? I asked as I moved his hand down my rib cage and abdomen and guided it between my legs. Do you dislike this? The corners of Heru's lips quirked, and he chuckled. No more coaxing was needed on my part. Chapter 37 Practice and Perfect Tell me what you are writing, Heru said as he pressed himself against the back of my body, his heat burning through the thin linen of my dress and wrapped his arms around my middle. He kissed my temple, keeping his lips pressed against that sensitive skin, his breath tickling the fine hairs growing there. My shoulders tensed, and I laughed softly. I leaned my head back against his shoulder and sighed. I am describing the sandstorm and what we were doing, or not doing, while we were stuck together in that little cavern. I craned my neck so I could see his face, and how angry you were. Heru started tracing slow circles around my belly button with his index finger. I was not angry. I scoffed, or at least I tried to. It came out as more of a shuddering exhale. You were most certainly angry. He stared into my eyes and shook his head. I was not. I was terrified. My eyebrows rose. You? Terrified? You are the most terrifying being I have ever met. His voice was soft. Even. I doubt that. The corners of his mouth twitched. And yet it is still true. He released me and captured my hand, guiding me toward the doorway to the altar room, where he'd laid out a small feast while I'd been working. A wineskin, fruits, cheeses, and flatbreads covered the altar itself. Again, I raised my eyebrows. How did you gather all of this so quickly? Heru frowned. You were inscribing for nearly an hour. It was not done so quickly. Oh. I did not realize it had been so long. I mirrored his frown and shook my head. How strange. Perhaps you should take a break for the rest of the night. I glanced at the opening at the top of the stairs, where the first hint of dawn light shone through the doorway. I believe it is already morning. Then perhaps you should take a break for the day. Giving his hand a squeeze, I stepped closer, stood on tiptoes, and pressed my lips against his. I will take a break to eat, I said when I pulled away, but then I really want to finish this room and get the next one started. I do not want to forget anything, forget to tell you anything. I searched his eyes. You would want to know everything, correct? That would set your mind at ease? As much as anything could. Short of seeing you standing before me, of holding you in my arms. His hands settled on either side of my neck, his thumbs fitting perfectly along my jaw. When his lips touched mine, his kiss was deep and penetrating, and I melted against him. I will allow you to continue your work, but you will allow it. He ignored my question. But... I will tell you what to write in this new room. I pushed the upper half of my body away from him, with hands on his bare chest, and eyed him. 
you want to write a note to your future self. A tantalizing half-smile touched his lips. Something like that. He held his hand out toward the array of food. Come, let us eat. Not twenty minutes later, we'd both had our fill and were standing in front of the false door on the right side of the altar room. My hand was pressed against the smooth, solidified ought, and my eyes were closed. I finalized my mental image of the structure I wanted to create, a simple, long hallway with plenty of space for many off-shooting rooms, should I require them. With a single focused thought, I unmade the false door and expanded the solidified ought away from me for nearly twenty yards. When I opened my eyes, I found myself standing before the doorway to a gleaming, pearlescent hallway. I stepped through the opening and made my way to the end of the hall, where I went through the same routine, except instead of another hallway, I formed a doorway that led to a circular domed chamber. Glancing over my shoulder, I found that Heru was still standing in the altar room, his focus on me hawkish. My nerves sprouted wings and fluttered in my stomach. Is something wrong? Ever so slowly, Heru shook his head. Do you have any idea what you look like when you do that? He approached, his pace steady, his movements smooth. I bit my lip and shook my head, watching him come closer. I felt like a cornered animal all of a sudden. Your skin glows and your hair floats around you like you are underwater. He didn't stop when he reached me but forced me backward into the freshly formed room with his body. You are a goddess, he said, his voice husky, his eyes darkening with promise. You are my goddess. My butt and shoulder blades touched smooth, cool wall, and Heru stopped, his body almost touching mine. Almost, but not quite. Make a door, little queen. Why? I asked, even as I willed one into being and darkness engulfed us. Because I am about to help you learn how to remain more focused on your surroundings while you write, and I do not want anyone to interrupt such a valuable lesson. It is too dangerous for you to remain so unaware. He breathed in deeply near my neck his exhale giving rise to goosebumps. But still, he didn't touch me. Give us light, little queen. I swallowed and did as he requested, making the walls glow with a soft luminescence. How? How are you going to help me learn to be more aware? A promising grin spread across his face. You are going to record everything I do to you. Describe how each touch makes you feel, until I decide that you have practiced enough. My breath hitched. The task sounded impossible. I do not think I will be very successful. I do not think you have much of a choice, because I am not stopping until every surface in this chamber is filled with your words. He moved so his mouth was just hovering over mine. I could lie, write gibberish, I said breathily. You would not be able to tell. Heru pulled away, his grin turning wolfish. In four thousand years I would. I imagined Marcus reading my descriptions of his past self making love to me, and my heartbeat faltered, then resumed beating triple time. Begin writing, little queen. I believe today is going to be quite interesting. I licked my lips and raised my eyes to the very top of the dome. Letting out a shuddering breath, I started writing. Your hands are sliding up my arms. Only your fingertips are on my skin. It almost tickles, but it feels too good. Goosebumps are spreading out from every place you're touching me. You're holding my arms over my head, commanding me to keep them there. 
Your fingers are skimming down my arms, down the sides of my body. Your touch is so gentle, so light. I want you to tear off my dress, but you're only lifting my skirt, slowly, so damn slowly. Everywhere you touch, my skin feels like it's on fire. I need you to. Oh my God, Marcus, you're on your knees and, and, and. Chapter 38 Routine and Disturbance Living with Haru and his family wasn't nearly as awkward as I'd expected it to be. Days passed, filled with mornings spent helping Sashachet with the two younger children while she did around-the-house things. Afternoons spent working in my underground sanctuary behind Nguyen's palace. Evenings spent training with Nguyen, and usually some combination of Set, Nikure, and Aset, and nights spent with Heru. True, Heru was almost always around me during the day's activities as well, but it was the nights that I treasured. I would erect an ought barrier in the doorway and windows of my sleeping chamber in his home, locking the two of us and our sounds inside until morning. And every morning, just as the sun was peeking over the cliffs surrounding the oasis and Haru and I were dozing together, limbs tangled and minds lulled into a contented sleep, a tapping would start on the other side of the aunt door. And, every morning, Haru and I would groan sleepily as we donned our discarded clothing before I willed the barriers to revert to their former state. Air. Tarset, Heru's youngest daughter, a tiny four-year-old, would scamper in for some early morning snuggles. She was so obviously a daddy's girl, and I was just grateful that her love of her father hadn't resulted in jealousy for all of the time he spent with me. In fact, the reverse seemed to be happening. Just before dawn, two weeks after Hero and I first bonded, I lay facing him on one of the thin pads that passed for mattresses in this time. I'd grown accustomed to them, had even started to sleep quite restfully, though spending every night sleeping beside Heru might have had something to do with that. The barriers covering the window openings were gone, letting fresh desert air fill the room, and Heru was tracing symbols on my hip with his fingertips, his eyes lidded with morning languor. My face scrunched as I concentrated, I stayed like that for several seconds while he ran through the series of symbols again, then shook my head. It is too many. You do not play fair, Heru. My lips twitched, but he held back a smile. Hathur Alexandra, he said, repeating the first symbol, a disc resting in the cradle of two curving cow horns, which had become his go-to symbol for me, since Alexandra was almost impossible to spell out phonetically using hieroglyphs. He moved on to the next symbols as he slowly uttered the rest of his tactile message. Is the goddess I will worship, the queen I will serve, the wife I will be faithful to, the woman I will love. His gaze seared my soul for all eternity. I blinked rapidly, fighting back the tears suddenly welling in my eyes, Leaning in, I pressed my lips against his, taking his mouth as tenderly as he'd taken my body only hours ago. Heru is the god I will worship, the king I will serve, the husband I will be faithful to, and the man I will love for all eternity, I said, a hair's breadth from his lips. I am no king. Not yet. I didn't say, I only smiled and stared into those molten, golden pools. One day, he would be the leader of our people, elected by the Council of Seven after both Nguyen and Heru's father, Osiris, the Nejere who would take over after Nguyen's death, were gone. But he didn't need to know that. Informing him of future deaths would only upset him. 
and causing him undue pain was the last thing I ever wanted to do. Tap, tap, tap. My eyes darted to one of the arched windows. The barest hint of golden sunlight was shining through the opening. As my lips curved into a smile, I held in a laugh. Based on the amusement sparkling in Heru's eyes, he was doing the same. How Tarsic could time her demanding little knock so perfectly every morning was beyond me. But she could, and it was the most welcome joke. I was starting to fall in love with that little girl. Just a little. Tap, tap, tap. After one final short kiss, I sat up and glanced around the fairly large and relatively unadorned space in search of my dress from yesterday. The room didn't need decoration, not with the graceful, swooping, and swirling embellishments Nguyen had worked into the solidified aunt when he'd created this place, but I had added a few creature comforts in the form of a standing wardrobe, a couple chairs, a small square table, a wash stand, and a screened-off toilet area, all fabricated from solidified aunt as well. I found my dress hanging from the corner of the nearest chair by one strap. I made my way across the room, knowing full well that Heru was watching my every movement from the bed, and slipped the dress over my head. By the time I turned around, Heru was already in the process of wrapping his kilt around his hips. He tied the intricate knot far more easily than I ever could, settled back on the bed, and nodded. Tap, tap, tap. Smiling, I moved to the aunt door and pressed my palm against its smooth surface. It dissolved into a quicksilver mass, and when I removed my hand, dissipated in a cloud of colorful, smoky tendrils, revealing a small girl with enormous, honey-brown eyes, chubby cheeks, and a mess of shoulder-length black hair haloing her head. Tarset's eyes were huge circles as she watched the final tendrils of fuchsia and lime green fade away. A broad grin spread across her round face, making her cheeks even chubbier. She giggled, then lunged forward, capturing my hand in both of hers and dragging me toward the bed. All right, little fig, what do you command of me this morning? I asked as I scooted into the thin mattress after her. I turned onto my side and propped my head up with my hand, watching Tarset maneuver Heru's arms into a position she deemed acceptable. Finally, she curled into a ball between us and sighed. I want to know what Zena does next. I suppressed a laugh and raised my eyebrows. You like that story more than the one I told yesterday. Tarset's round face scrunched and she shook her head. Why does the princess need a boy to save her? She should save herself. I couldn't help it. I threw my head back and laughed, pulling Tarset closer to me. I hugged her tightly. You would fit in well where I come from, Tarsi. She abandoned her father and snuggled closer against my torso, and I realized that I'd fallen in love with this little girl more than just a little bit. One day, in the distant future, it was practically ordained that Haru and I would have a couple children of our own. Assuming my body ever reached the bonding pheromone saturation point, and the time I spent with Tarset made me yearn for that day's arrival, but it also set a deep-seated sadness further and further into my heart, because that day would only come after Tarset was a 4,000-year memory. Part of me longed to share my bittersweet torment with Heru, but doubt paralyzed my tongue every time I considered telling him. What if Nguyen was wrong? What if it never happened? What if we failed, and the chute tore me apart from the ba out, causing both my and Heru's deaths? What if... There were too many what-ifs. Gazing at me with those big amber eyes, Tarset said, Will you take me there someday? I want to see where you come from. My throat constricted and my heart lurched. When my chin started to tremble, I forced myself to take slow, deep breaths. I shook my head. I wish I could, little fig. I really do, but it is a place that only I can go. 
because you are a goddess? Something like that. She touched the corner of my eye where a tear was doing its damnedest to break free. Why are you sad? Because someday soon, I will have to return to that place. She stuck out her lower lip in a pout, then smiled. But you will come back. My next deep breath was noticeably shaky. I do not know if I will be able to, little fig. Then I will visit you. Tarsi, you said that sometimes Zena goes to the places where only the gods can go. That is what I will do. Her eyes shone with fierce determination. I forced a tremulous smile and nodded. Okay, I lied. I would like that very much, I think. Good. She rolled onto her back and stared up at the high, opalescent ceiling. Now, tell me what happens to Zena next. Laughing a soft, miserable laugh, I met Heru's gaze, and my tears broke free. I squeezed my eyes shut and cleared my throat. When Zena found out what happened to her son. It was mid-morning, and Nikure, Tarset, and I were sitting in the flower garden in the center of Heru's household's private orchard, surrounded by date and doum palms, as well as fig, olive, and peach trees, and with the palace's aught spires reaching high overhead, blocking the sun. Heru and two of his grown sons were clearing sand from the aqueduct's gutter, technology Nguyen had stolen from a later time. While Nakure was helping me practice my ability to control small pieces of aught more fluidly, physically manipulating the aught may have been the only special power he had access to through his shoot, but he had hundreds of years to perfect every minute nuance. The flower garden was the only place outdoors where we felt comfortable using our unique abilities, since the orchards were completely surrounded by the stone buildings belonging to Heru's descendants, and none in his line would ever betray him by sharing our secrets. Russ was frolicking among the poppies and rose bushes, chasing a delicate crystalline butterfly as it flew gracefully around the garden. Nakure had created the stunning little creature and was controlling its flight with the thinnest tether of aught stretching from its tail end to his index finger. Giggling, Tarset clapped as she watched. Nakure's butterfly returned to him, landing on his open palm and falling still once again. Now you try it again, he said, turning his pale blue eyes on me. I blew out a breath and glanced down at my own, tetherless butterfly, then at Russ, who'd settled in the sandy dirt like a sphinx, but hadn't taken his eyes off Nakure's butterfly. It does not seem to matter how many times I try, Nakure. Nakure patted my knee with his free hand. It took me nearly a month to learn how to maintain the tether. You learned to do as much in two days, he smiled. You doubt yourself too much, my friend. I couldn't help but return his smile, though mine wasn't nearly as confident. I took a deep breath. Very well. Here goes. I touched my index finger to the butterfly's tail and pulled my hand away, creating a thin thread of unset aught between me and the figurine. Now came the hard part, willing each tiny movement into a seamless, flowing motion. The left wing twitched. The right wing stuttered open. The left wing mirrored the movement a half second later. Both wings glided upwards, closing together in a single, smooth motion. I squealed, as did Tarset, and released the tether. I did it! <laughs> my cheeks ached with the strength of my ecstatic grin, but as soon as my eyes met Nakure's, my excitement faded and my smile slipped. His eyes were wide, his face even paler than usual. What? He pointed to my hand. Look at your skin, Lex. I did. It was glowing with a faint sheen of iridescence, shimmering with every color imaginable. Shit, I hissed, just as I felt the telltale clenching sensation in my chest. For the second time, 
My borrowed chute was overflowing with too much power. I jumped to my feet. Tarset, take Russ and run inside to your mother. She stared at me with round eyes, her butt apparently glued to the ground. Now, Tarset. Her eyes widened even further, but she didn't hesitate. She scooped up the kitten and sprinted through the orchard. I stumbled in the opposite direction, trying to think of the most remote place I could flee to in the shortest amount of time. If the power exploded out of me when others were too close to me, it might just obliterate them. I'd almost reached the outer edge of the orchard when electricity thrummed in my chest and my knee gave out. Catching myself with one hand on the sandy ground, I pushed myself back up to my feet and searched for a path that led away from the cluster of buildings that belonged to Heru's family. I had to get away before the power broke free, and I destroyed them. Another pulse crackled out from my chest, a little bit more intense, and I doubled over. Someone grabbed my wrist. Nikure, I realized, hoisting my arm over his shoulders and wrapping his own around my waist. I have to get out of the oasis, I told him between rapid breaths. This way. He started guiding me at a quick walk, though I couldn't say where he was guiding me to, since all of my strength and concentration was going into holding the destructive energy inside me. Heru comes, he said. Heru's scent surrounded me as his arm joined Nakure's, lending additional support. Together, they dragged me toward somewhere I could only hope would be secluded. Darkness surrounded us, and I realized we were in a tunnel that led through the limestone cliffs, walling off the oasis from the rest of the desert. How long can you hold it in, Alexandra? Heru asked. I gritted my teeth, the power expanding inside me in more frequent and more intense pulses. Not much longer. Suddenly, strong arms scooped me up and I was being carried much faster than I'd been able to move on my own two feet. We burst back into the light, Heru carrying me out into the desert at a full sprint. Put me down, Heru. I was losing control. I could feel the electric power crackling over my skin. Now! Gently, he set me down on the sand, and I curled my legs up to my chest and hugged my knees. Heru, I rasped. Nikure, run. I clenched my jaw and took shuddering breaths. Wetness coated my cheeks as I held the expanding power in, hoping to give Heru and Nakure time to get far enough away from me. I dug my nails into my palms. I wedged my face between my knees. I squeezed my eyes shut. Throwing my head back, I screamed and the power exploded from me in wave after wave of bone-shattering electricity. My flesh shredded, my muscles ashed away from me. I was unmade. For an eternity, I knew nothing but pain. Between one breath and the next, the outpouring of power ceased, snapping back into me and quieting. And suddenly, I was whole again. I took harsh breaths, enjoying the feel of air whooshing in and out of my brand new lungs, of my brand new heart pumping oxygen-rich blood to my brand new organs and muscles. I could hear the faint swish-swish of footsteps in the sand, but my mind wasn't clear enough to make out where they were coming from. I just breathed, in and out, in and out, in and out. Arms were around me pulling me close to a hard body. That scent, spicy and intoxicating and comforting. Warmth, happiness, home. Is it done? Someone asked. Nekure, I thought somewhere in the back of my mind. It is, someone else said, the one who was holding me. Hero, though with how much she has been using the shoot, I cannot imagine why it happened in the first place. She could not possibly use these powers any more than she already does. How could it build up to overflowing like that? 
It did not last so long last time. No, Haru said. It did not. The fractured pieces of my mind rearranged, fitting back together. I sucked in a deep breath and clutched Heru. My fingers dug into the firm flesh on his back. How long did it last? I asked, my voice hoarse from that initial scream. Heru's arms tightened around me, and he pressed his lips to the top of my head. The sun is already beginning its descent, which meant it was late afternoon. I'd been out in the Sahara, unrelenting power exploding out of me, for hours. I feared that we were running out of time, that I was running out of time. I took a deep, fortifying breath and loosened my hold on Heru, pulling my head away from his shoulder. I looked into his eyes. We need to talk to Nguyen. Chapter 39 Destruction and Sacrifice Take the shoot out of her, was Heru's greeting to Nguyen as the three of us barged past his guards, who never would have stopped me in the first place, and into his private chambers, which were about midway up in his palace's tallest tower. Nguyen was in his compact, circular courtyard, sitting cross-legged at the head of a tiny pool filled with silvery fish, trailing his fingers through the water. It was where I usually found him. He'd once told me that the water helped him think, that its movement was so similar to the movement of time that it focused his thoughts, making the complex web of past, present, and future more understandable. As we entered the courtyard, Nguyen turned a steady gaze on Heru. There was something off about him, though I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I cannot, and I will not, he said calmly. Heru strode forward, leaving Nakure and me to watch from just inside the wide, multi-arched doorway. He stopped on the opposite side of the pool from Nguyen and pointed back at me. She had another of those attacks. It is killing her. I am quite aware, but if I tried to remove it, she would die instantaneously. Heru's arm slowly sank. The only thing that surprises me, Nguyen said, is that this second attack did not happen sooner. He turned his attention to me, and it took me a moment to recognize what was different about him. His eyes were still brilliant, but they shone with a silvery opalescence, much like the default appearance of solidified ought, instead of their usual rainbow hues. I rushed forward to stand beside Heru. Nguyen, your eyes. Nguyen gestured absentmindedly to his face with one hand. While the presence of my shoot creates suffering for you, dear Alexandra, its absence does the same for me, it would seem. I rounded the pool in three lurching steps, falling to my knees at his side. I know pulling all of it out of me would kill me, but can you take some to save yourself? His moonlight gaze washed over my face, and he shook his head. You must learn as much as you can as quickly as you can, dear Alexandra for I think this body is not long for this world. My blood chilled as I wrapped my hands around his, demanding his full attention. No, Nguyen, not yet. But I must. It is what has always been and will always be. His full, familiar lips curved into a smile. That is what you had a said tell me, after you saved her. So many years ago. I... I reared back. What? Nguyen, what are you talking about? Ah, long ago. It was how I knew you were the right choice. His eyes narrowed, and he tilted his head to the side, studying me. Long ago for me, at least. Still to come for you. You should not have chosen her. Heru said from directly behind me, 
You should have chosen another. Nguyen blinked, his silvery eyes slowly angling upward. But I did not choose Alexandra. She chose herself. Heru's sharp stare shifted to me. Eyebrows drawn together, I shook my head. I didn't think Nguyen was all there at the moment, especially because I most certainly hadn't chosen this path for myself. I helped Nguyen to his feet and guided him through the doorway that led to his crescent-shaped bedroom. Heru and Nikure remained in the courtyard. I sat on the edge of Nguyen's bed and, once he'd settled himself on the thin mattress, stared into those unfamiliar eyes. Rest, Nguyen, and I shall return for lessons in a few hours. He peered up at me, his eyes regaining some of their usual sparkle, if not their usual rainbow brilliance, and he chuckled softly. I see that you and Heru have been quite busy. I shook my head. I don't... What are you talking about? The saturation point, dear Alexandra. You have reached it. He shrugged. It is yet another sign that my time, and your time here, is coming to an end. Tonight, I believe I will explain to you how to use the chute to travel through time. I'd reached the bonding pheromone saturation point. What did that mean exactly? But I still don't know how to restore Ma'at. Ah, but you do. The same thing that will restore balance to your body will restore Ma'at to the universe. He paused, watching me closely. When I said nothing, merely stared at him in bafflement, he added, When the shoots that once belonged to Apep and myself are merged with brand new beings, those beings will become the new Netjer, the next generation of true gods, the next guardians of Ma'at in this universe. And still, I stared at him eyes widened by shock. My... my children? Smiling kindly, he nodded. Heru and me, having kids. I shook my head slowly. That is what's supposed to save the universe? Indeed it is, dear Alexandra. I don't... I continued to shake my head. That doesn't... I knocked the universe out of balance when I stole a pep's chute and stored it within this body along with my own. Your children must be kept safe long enough to come into their power. They must be protected from a pep. I nodded, more than a little numb. Of course. Nguyen closed his eyes for a moment. I am so very weary. Oh, um, I cleared my throat. I'll let you rest and come back later. Before I could stand, Nguyen's long fingers wrapped around my wrist. But you cannot kill a pip. I eased back down onto the bed frame and shook my head my mind taking a moment to catch up to Nguyen's abrupt change of topics. But then he'll always be a threat. No, my Alexandra, I mean that you are incapable of killing a pep. Only I could do that, but I never would, because to kill a pep would destroy Ma'at completely. A pep is what is cannot not be. The universe is part of a pep, just as it is part of me, or the Ra, part of me, and it cannot exist without either of us. Nguyen exhaled heavily. Again, I shook my head. But how am I supposed to protect? What am I supposed to do then? You must trap him in a Netjerat's body then trap that Netjerat as well. Set. Nguyen nodded, his eyelids drifting shut. 
If Apep roams free, he will possess one of your children. He will use them to destroy Ma'at, and then the universe will unravel until nothing is. He said nothing more for several heartbeats, and I thought he'd fallen asleep until his eyelids fluttered open. If Apep becomes free before you can trap Set's body, then you must seal him inside a prison of solidified art. It is the only other thing that can contain a being such as him. Nguyen's odd, moonstone eyes locked on mine. You must not let him possess you or Heru. Your bond is the key, and it will unlock either a future of balance or a future of destruction, of nothing. His eyelids slid closed again, and he sighed. If he possesses you while you still contain the chute, or Heru for that matter, once his chute is made whole within him, then you must give the chute to another, must sacrifice yourselves for a chance. Dropping Nguyen's hand, I stood and backed away. No. My head turned from side to side, slowly. We won't. I will not kill myself. That was never part of the deal. Nguyen opened his eyes and speared me with his sharp gaze. There is no deal. There is only truth. I am no martyr. No, dear Alexandra. You are no martyr. You are the Mezwet, the girl child, the messiah of all that ever was, is, or will be. You are far from a martyr. His eyes closed, and his chest rose and fell several times, until his eyelids opened one final time. His irises were dulled, but once again, shimmering with swirling colors. You are a god. I backed away another step, shaking my head more adamantly. I'm no god, I thought. I'm no god. But what came out was, gods don't die. The words were barely a whisper. All things die. Chapter 40 Life and Death Heru and I returned to his home shortly after leaving Nguyen's palace, Nikure having already split off to alert a set of Nguyen's sudden decline. I didn't tell either of them about the disturbing information Nguyen had relayed, that Heru's and my children would be destined to a life of near-absolute power and crushing responsibility or about his haunting final remark. All things die, and I refused to consider that such a sacrifice, my life or Heru's, would be the culmination of Nguyen's grand machinations. I'd never been idealistic, and I didn't host any romantic notions about my true nature. I was not a martyr. I was a survivor, and suicide by sacrifice didn't fit in with my survival instincts. The grounds were eerily quiet as we approached the familiar cluster of buildings belonging to Heru's family. My fingers were interlocked with Heru's, but my free hand was clenched into a tight fist. It would not come to that. No way in hell. I shook my head. It wouldn't come to that because Nguyen would recover from his temporary lapse into godly dementia, spend however long it took teaching me everything I needed to know to trap Apep, either in set or not, and to return to my native time. And then I would figure out what to do about the whole godly children thing, and everything would work out. Happily ever afters all around. I clenched my fist more tightly, my nails digging into my palm painfully. Something is wrong, Heru said, stopping before the columned entrance to his palace. He gave my hand a squeeze, then released it. 
I searched my mind for an excuse for my withdrawn mood, but when I looked at him, he was scanning the neat little gardens, the stone houses surrounding the palace, and even the path we'd walked. He wasn't talking about me. Heru looked up at the sun, still hours from the horizon. They never go in this early. There is still much to do. I frowned. Maybe... Maybe Sesha pulled everyone inside when Tarsi found her and told her about what happened. Maybe. Heru took the stairs leading up to the palace's arched doorway, two at a time, me close on his heel. The air was scented with vomit and sweat, and I had to suppress a gag. Sesha, he called. There was no response. Sesha, where are you? A groan came from one of the back rooms, accompanied by the faint sound of weeping. Without our heightened hearing, I doubted that either of us would have heard it. Heru made his way through several sparsely furnished chambers and down a long hallway, filled with late afternoon sunlight, that led to the back of the palace, to the cozy room where the three youngest children slept. Sesheset was kneeling on the floor, beside one of the three polished wood-framed beds, carved to display a bevy of animals, native to Egypt, her head resting on her curled-up arm on the edge of the bed, and her body shaking with each of her faint sobs. Tarset lay atop the bed, her skin pallid and coated in a sheen of sweat, and her breaths quick and shallow. A brief glance at the other two beds told me they were occupied by the other two children, who also appeared unwell, but not nearly as ill as Tarset. Sesha, Heru strode into the room and dropped to his knees, beside his pregnant wife. When Sesha didn't look up, didn't show any sign of having heard him, he shook her shoulder. Sesha. She raised her head and turned red-rimmed eyes on him. With a wail, she threw herself into his arms and started crying in earnest. I watched Heru attempt to comfort her, rubbing her back, murmuring soft, nonsensical words, rocking her, before making my way around the room, checking on the other two children. They were both burning up, but neither seemed to be having as much trouble breathing as Tarset was having. I stopped at the head of Tarset's narrow bed and stared down at her. Her eyes were closed, her mouth open, and each ragged, rattling breath was clearly a struggle. My stomach nodded, and fissures laced through my heart. Not her. What happened? I swallowed roughly. How? Without warning, Sesheshet spun on her knees and wrapped her arms around my thighs, hugging my legs and staring up at me with hope-filled eyes. I beg of you, save her. Please. Slowly, I shook my head. I do not know how to. Please, she repeated, desperation making her voice hoarse. Please, you must be able to do something. This ailment already claimed Bunefer, and now it seeks my sweet Tarset. Whatever you say, you have the powers of the gods. I know you do. Please, Alexandra, use this great power you have. Save my little girl, please. I... Do not drink any water. It's been poisoned, Aset said as she rushed into the room. Nakure close on her heels. She scanned the beds quickly. Ah, oh, but I see I am too late. Can you save them? Heru asked his sister, his voice rough. Aset approached the foot of Tarset's bed and shook her head. I can do nothing for her, but the other two I may be able to save. She moved to Heru's youngest son's bed and bent over the boy. My throat constricted. Aset, Dr. Isa in my time, was a healer even now, but it would do no good for the little girl who'd snuggled her way into my heart. Aset couldn't help her. Tarset was going to die. Not her. Please. Sesherset's hands were clutching the backs of my legs so hard that it was painful. Help her, Alexandra. 
I licked my lips, unable to tear my eyes away from Tarset's uncharacteristically pale face. I cannot save her, Sesha. But I know someone who can. In my time, far in the future, Nephi was an even more talented healer than Aset, and with modern equipment, I knew she was the dying child's best chance. Plus, I had a moderately insane idea of a way to bring Tarset to her. Nguyen's words replayed in my head. As the ought expands in this plane, it does not displace matter, but replaces it. It is as though you are transposing that alternate plane onto this one, but only in a delineated place. And while the odd matter is here, whatever it is displacing is frozen in time. Frozen in time. You will take her there, to this future healer. Seshashet's eyes welled with a resurgence of tears. I nodded, but my stomach churned with uncertainty. And then you will return her. I, swallowing roughly, I shook my head. Even I cannot do that. But she will have a chance to live her life. There. Then you will take care of her. You will love her and raise her as your own daughter. You will do this for me. I stroked Sesachet's hair as my own tears welled. My saliva felt so thick, my mouth so dry, that I had to swallow several times before I could respond. I will, Sesha. I swear it, I said, not adding, if she survives. Then do it, please, I beg of you. Just save her. Let her live. I have lost too many. Just let her live. Heru stood, and I raised my eyes to meet his gaze. He nodded. I returned the nod and leaned over the short headboard to place my fingertips on Tarset's forehead. I concentrated, squeezed my eyes shut, took a deep breath, and all at once I willed the ought to replace every single cell of Tarset's body with solidified ought. There was a sharp gasp, and Seshashet's arms fell away from me. Is she? Is she? She is not dead. I opened my eyes and stared down at what appeared to be a perfect quartz sculpture of a slumbering little girl. She is frozen in time, in every time between now and the future, when I will return her to the way she was, to her, it should only be a blink, I said, hoping with every fiber of my being that I was right. I held my breath and glanced at Nakure. He had far more experience with this particular ability. His lips were curved downward and his eyes were narrowed in thought. But ever so slowly, he nodded. I exhaled in relief. Sessa Shet was running the backs of her fingers over her daughter's stone-like face. And your future healer will be able to save her when you wake her. I closed my eyes for several seconds. When I opened them back up, I met Sessa Shet's watery stare. If she cannot heal her, no one can. Sessa Shet bowed her head. Thank you, Alexandra, she whispered. Thank you. Heru placed his hand on her shoulder and met my eyes, those liquid golden pools filled with more loss and gratitude and love than words could ever express. I offered him a small smile and forced it to remain as a horrifying thought filled my veins with ice. Nguyen, he hadn't been suffering from some godly form of dementia caused by missing his shoot He'd been suffering from the effects of this poison, and the most likely culprit was someone who'd been possessed by a pep and was using poison to weaken Nguyen enough that he couldn't fight as his shoot was torn out of him. Except his shoot wasn't in him. It was in me, leaving him all but defenseless. 
I left Heru and Sesachet to their mourning and crossed to the doorway, where Nakure still stood sentry. I grabbed his elbow and pulled him into the long hallway. He let me guide him away from the sick room, and when I stopped and faced him, he watched me curiously. I think this is a pep's doing, all so he can distract the rest of us and weaken Nguyen. Think about how Nguyen was when we saw him. Nakure stiffened, his eyes searching my face, but not really seeing as he processed my words. His eyes widened. You must go to him. Now, Heru and I will only be minutes behind you. The colorful, misty tendrils of Ott were already swirling around me when I heard my name. I looked at the doorway to the sick room, where Heru was standing. His eyes met mine. And then, I was gone. Chapter 41 Ashes and Dust I appeared in Nguyen's tower bedroom in a silent burst of misty colors and found myself standing at the foot of his bed. A woman, wearing the usual white linen shift, was sitting astride him, her head bowed as though she were looking down and her shoulders and arms moving in a jerking motion. I could only see the bottom half of Nguyen's legs, but based on the groans coming from him, I initially thought I'd made a mistake. He was fine, and I'd burst in on an amorous moment, until I noticed the cords binding his ankles together, pale against the bronze of his skin. I knew Nguyen as well as anyone could know the Great Father, and I felt absolutely certain that he would never allow himself to be put in restraints. He was too important, his purpose too significant to everything, to place himself in such a vulnerable position. My first inhale confirmed my worst fears. The tang of blood, mixed with a foul stench of feces and a sharp sourness, hung thick in the air. A cold detachment cloaked me, and in another flash of colors, I shifted to the side of the bed. The woman was a poet, I could now see, Nguyen's primary human wife. Her hands and wrists were coated in a crimson sheen as they worked a bronze dagger between Nguyen's legs, and she seemed to be castrating him with excruciating slowness. The skin above his groin had been carved almost delicately, but the pervasive stench told me just how deep those cuts went into Nguyen's body. The coldness seeped further into me, taking root in the core of my being. I reacted without thought. On my next inhale, before Ipwet even had a chance to turn her head in my direction, my hand was around her neck. I watched, fascinated, as the ot crept across her skin, overtaking her body completely in a matter of seconds. Her opalescent face was locked in a wide-eyed, open-mouthed expression that could have been permanent, except, unlike Tarset, I didn't desire any sense of permanency for this woman, this monster. Narrowing my eyes, I willed the atoms of aught that had replaced Ipwet's physical body to separate, to shatter into a seemingly infinite cloud of solidified aught. She exploded with a soft poof, and the particles that had once been her, spread out and misted to the floor until she was nothing more than a layer of imperceptibly thin dust. I exhaled harshly and sucked in another rancid breath, but in my cool, detached state, the stench didn't bother me. I stared down at Nguyen, my hands hovering over his ruined middle. Despite the chill in my soul, I couldn't help but choke on a sob. When I slid my gaze up his torso to his face, I saw that he was gagged, and his eyes, once again radiating their faded swirl of brilliant colors, were shifting focus back and forth between mine and some point behind me, because it wet hadn't been alone. In the blink of an eye, I shifted to the other side of the bed and reappeared, facing my would-be attackers. There were three of them, all male, 
and all bigger and notably stronger than me, and all exuding an air of menace, and based on the way they moved, they were all measure, which meant they were even stronger, even faster, even more highly skilled than any human. In the cool detachment, this was all so easy to see. I grinned. I was more than a Nezheret. A foreign, alien power flowed through my body, wound around my soul. I was a goddess. Who the hell did they think they were? Ipwet's minions? Assassins? Traitors to our people? Maybe. They may have been all of those things, but they were also dead. They were insects waiting to be squished under my heel. They just didn't know it yet. Before the one in the lead could reach Nguyen's bed, before he could even consider finishing the job Ibwet had started, I shifted. I winked into existence directly behind him, giving form to an ought dagger in my right hand as I did, and slid the razor-sharp blade across the front of his neck. Taking hold of his shoulders, I turned and shoved him at my other two opponents. Dark arterial blood sprayed their bare chests and stained their pristine linen kilts as he collapsed against them. Mirroring each other, they sidestepped away, letting their companion's body settle on the polished floor. A glossy pool of blood spread out around his upper half, almost hypnotizing as it seeped from his dying body. The two still standing circled around me, they kept their distance, but they watched. They weighed and measured me. They had knives, I noted, longer than mine, and glinting copper in the late afternoon light that streamed through the tall, arched window openings. It didn't matter. Their knives wouldn't save them. Not from me. Go, I said, as I turned in a slow circle to keep them in my sight. Run from this place and never return, and I will spare you. I raised my hand, palm up. I would run if I were you. The one on the left looked like he might bolt, but the man on the right laughed. So be it, I said. I created a sheet of ought as thick as a single atom in my upturned palm and expanded it toward the Nezheret's necks. With merely a thought, both sets of eyes widened for the briefest moment as the invisible guillotine sliced cleanly through their flesh before I retracted the sheet of aught. Almost in slow motion, their heads slid forward while their bodies remained in place. Their fleshy skulls landed on the floor with a smack, rolling in haphazard directions while their bodies crumpled nearby. Clap. Clap, clap. My gaze glided to the doorway, where Onkins and Peppy stood. One shoulder leaned against the grooved frame. I honestly thought Heru was the one Ra had given his shoot to. But you, that was an exquisite display of wielding the power. I tilted my head to the side watching the slender, beautiful woman. She seemed so much more brittle now, too severe, too harsh, too sharp. Her lips spread into a wide grin. I will put on an even more stunning display when I am wearing your skin. Her eyes were filled with a telltale inky darkness, slithering around in the surface of her irises. I thought that should have elicited a reaction from me. A scream, maybe, or at least a shudder. But all I did was return her measuring stare. A pep, I said, with a barest nod. A pep, Onkinson Peppy's lip curled into a sneer. Heru's whore. I raised one shoulder and let it drop, unaffected by her words. I take it... That is all you're doing, I gestured to Nguyen, who was still gagged and tied to the bed a few feet behind me, his gut sliced open. His laborious breaths told me he was still alive. 
I drew on the coolness seeping into my soul from the foreign shoot I possessed. The inner chill helped me to maintain my composure, while inside, part of me was screaming in rage and agony and horror. With a low chuckle, a pep Unkinson peppy pushed off the archway and took slow steps into the bedchamber. Yes, she hissed, her eyes trained on me. And imagine my surprise when I discovered only the tiniest slivers of shoot inside him. I let him keep those slivers, let it sustain him while Ipwet played. The old bag was so desperate for revenge to make Nguyen feel the pain she felt every time she gave birth to one of his little whelps. When Apep Unkinson Peppy was only steps away from me, she leered, her eyes scanning over me from head to toe. Not quite as lush as this one. I've quite enjoyed the days I've spent in Cassie's body. But I think I will enjoy possessing that live body of yours as well. Playing with it, with Heru. Her next step brought her almost within arm's reach. I do so prefer female bodies. There are so many more ways to possess them, to invade them. You are boring me, I said, as I took a step back and raised my hand. Vines of ought sprouted from the polished floor wrapping around her ankles and climbing up her legs, effectively restraining her. Another ought dagger appeared in my hand, and I wrapped my fingers around its hilt. A pep Onkinson peppy smiled. Besides, Nguyen and Heru, how many other Netgerat men have you let bed you? Whore, queen, Nekure and Set, I assume, since you spend so much time with them as well. When I am wearing your body, I will take them all over and over again. Her gaze flicked behind me to Nguyen. Except for the great father. She cocked her head to the side. Although I suppose we could engage in a little necrophilia just this once. She was goading me, I realized. You want me to kill you, I said, willing my dagger back out of existence. I narrowed my eyes. Why? Awareness dawned a moment later. Ah, because you cannot leave that body while it still lives. Behind me, Nguyen said something incomprehensible against his linen gag. I looked over my shoulder and the moment my eyes landed on his savaged body, the cold, detached veil his chute had settled over me evaporated, and panic surged in my chest. He is too far gone. Shut up, I snapped, flinging out my hand and erecting a glassy dome of aught over Nguyen's bed, sealing the two of us in our own private world for however much time he had left. I sat on the edge of the bed and reached for his gag. I sliced it off with a small, sharp aught knife, then did the same with the cords binding his neck, arms, and legs. A film of tears coated my cheeks. My Alexandra, Nguyen rasped as I finished cutting through his ankle bindings. He took a shallow breath. A pep is correct. I am dying. I took a hold of his hand with both of mine. Let's go into the aught. You won't feel the pain there. He shook his head. My body is too weak. If I go into the aught, it will fail and I will not be able to tell you what I must. I swallowed thickly, holding in a convulsive sob. I'd known this was going to happen, that he was going to die while I was in this time, but knowing it and watching it were two different things entirely. I loved him and the thought of losing him. Tell me what to do, Nguyen, 
just tell me what to do. There has to be some way I can use the shoot to... No, my dear sweet Alexandra. He laughed softly, but it quickly turned into a cough and a pained grimace. I always knew this would be when this body died. I just didn't know how it would happen. He coughed again. Quite painfully, it would seem. My head was shaking from side to side, and my mouth was open, like I wanted to say something, but I didn't know what. You must be careful of the oneness. Your mind is not capable of continuing to function fully when you've embraced the shoot so completely. The oneness? I asked, wondering if he was referring to the cold detachment that had taken over, allowing me to kill four people without hesitation or remorse. I'd killed four people. Nguyen's eyes shifted to some point behind me, and before I could launch into a full-on breakdown, he said, Ah, your boys have arrived. I glanced over my shoulder to see Heru, Nakure, and Set racing into the room. A pep Unkinson peppy appeared to be having some sort of a fit, flailing and shouting nonstop against the aunt vines binding her, though I had no idea what she was saying, and I really didn't care. I met Heru's eyes through the barrier only briefly before turning my attention back to Nguyen. He swallowed, the action visibly difficult. I thought we would have a little more time. But we do not. Another shallow inhale. Lower the barrier, Alexandra. My end draws near and there is something I must do before... I straightened, released his hand, and rose, moving to the place where Heru stood on the opposite side of the aught barrier, his hands pressed against the glassy material. I raised my hand and placed my palm against his. The solidified aught melted away in a colorful mist, and Heru's arms were suddenly around me in a brief but intense embrace. When he released me, he took two large steps towards Nguyen's bedside. Great father, he said, as he knelt and bowed his head. I have failed you. You have not. Nguyen's voice was barely a whisper. His eyes met mine over Heru's close-shaven head. Come here, my Alexandra. He held up his other hand, and I moved around the head of the bed to sit on the opposite side. I had a vague awareness of Nakure keeping Apep Onkinson Peppy quiet, and sat, moving closer as I took hold of Nguyen's hand. A tingling warmth engulfed my fingers, spreading up my arms and settling in my chest. Nguyen, what? I have made the shoot within you whole. He smiled faintly his eyes sparkling with unshed tears. There was no longer any hint of any shade of red, orange, or gold in his irises. You must be careful of the oneness. A moment later, Nguyen touched the fingertips of his other hand to Heru's forehead. Heru closed his eyes and shuddered, and I assumed he was feeling the same odd sensation I'd just felt as Nguyen implanted the last remainder of a peps shoot within him. Nguyen removed his fingers from Heru's forehead and raised his hand to the side of my face. His skin was icy against my cheek. You have a few weeks at most before the shoot overtakes you. You know what you must do. A chill enshrouded me, and shaking my head, I searched his face. 
dread was a snake writhing in my gut. But I don't even know how to get home. If he died, I never would, and in a few weeks, I would follow him to the grave, as would Heru. Nguyen's eyes held no hint of the rainbow shimmer at all, only a pale opalescence akin to moonstone, haunting in its unfamiliarity. Simply enter the art, ba, shoot, and body, thinking of your time, and you should be transported there. I was still shaking my head, but how? He took a slightly deeper, shuddering breath. Remember when I pulled you into a time of my own making? I nodded. Just walk into a wall of art. Into, not through, and you will enter that plane. A cough racked his body, and all things in his ruined abdomen squished and squelched. I swallowed a gag. Remember what must be done if a pep cannot be trapped. Eyes stinging with a resurgence of tears, I swallowed. I am afraid. I am so scared of not being. His gaze softened. As am I, dear Alexandra. As am I. Chin trembling. I turned my head and pressed my lips against Nguyen's palm. I love you, old friend. And I you, my Alexandra, he said, his voice barely audible. Now listen closely. Unpleasant things have happened, will happen. Let them for your future. For the future, he paused. You must save a set from her captor. Tell her who you are so I will know to find you, to protect you. He exhaled completely and closed his eyes. The three of us held our breath, waiting hoping those eyes would open again. I bit my lip to hold in a convulsive sob. Nguyen's eyes opened and focused on me. He licked his lips, coating them with blood-tinged saliva. His faint smile was kind, and it broke my heart. I believe, his fingers slid down the side of my face, in you. His hand hit the thin mattress with a soft thud, and he exhaled again. His eyes remained open, but they were no longer seeing. Chapter 42 Destroy and Protect Nguyen was dead. I felt a pulse of electric power in my chest. Nguyen who'd been around my entire life, who'd watched over me, protected me, befriended me, was dead. The power coming from Nguyen's shoot pulsed again, thrumming in time with my heartbeat. Alexandra, Heru's voice was barely a whisper, but the soft sound was overflowing with warning. Your skin. I looked down at my hands, at my arms, Ribbons and tendrils of misty aught thrashed around me, making it look like I was covered in flames of every possible color. I jumped to my feet and started backing away from the bed. I had to flee. I had to get away from these people that I loved before I incinerated them all. I had to. The power spindled inside of me around the chute, a tiny tornado of relentless, endless energy not of this world. This was different than before. More. I didn't have enough time. I didn't have any time. Shield them, Nakure, I shouted, 
and the words were overrun by a scream. My scream. The power broke free. A supernova of light and electricity and destruction. I had no choice but to throw my arms open, to let the fabric of space and time pour through me and expand in a world where it had no place, where all it could do was destroy. The floor shook beneath my feet, crackling and roaring, and thunder filled my ears. I could hear screaming and laughing. A pep Onkinson peppy was cackling joyously. I was wrong about you, she said. You are not Heru's whore. You are the mistress of death and chaos. Of me. And you will kill them all for me. You will kill them all. More of the ought poured through me, invading this world, expanding into its cracks, tearing it apart. Kill them all. Let me taste their confusion. Let me feast on their horror. Let me bathe in their misery. Kill them all for me. Become me. Kill them all for me. Become me. My eyes snapped open, and I speared a Pep Onkinson Peppy with a glare. No way in hell. She was standing within a thin, semi-opaque cylinder of solidified aught, with Heru, Set, and Nakure. All three men were on their knees, trying to keep from falling over completely as the palace shook, and Nakure's hand was pressed against the wall of Ott, feeding everything he had into it to hold it in place against the relentless onslaught of energy flowing out of me. Some hidden history threaded through the chute entered my awareness, and I understood this moment, this choice, my choice. This was what had led to a pep's downfall to begin with. He, no, it, as I now knew that neither Apep nor Ra, Nguyen's true name, were of any gender, chose to let its shoot take control, to lash about, wild and free. This was what sparked the chain of events that led to Nguyen, Ra, tearing away Apep's shoot and hiding it within an unborn human child. This unraveling chaos was the future a pep desired, but it wasn't the future I desired. I controlled the power. The power didn't control me. Screaming, I gritted my teeth and pulled the energy back. It resisted. I pulled harder, dropping to my hands and knees. I dug my fingers into the solidified aught floor, like it was room temperature butter and heaved. The unleashed power sunk hooks into the largest, sturdiest thing around, the limestone cliffs surrounding the oasis. Using every drop of willpower within me, I yanked one final time. The cliffs gave way, the power snapping back inside me with such an intense reverberation that I was knocked onto my side, momentarily stunned. A deep rumble vibrated in the air. A monster, groaning as it opened its mouth to swallow us all. Not a monster. The cliffs were groaning. They were collapsing. I could feel them. I could feel everything. Every life. Every ba. Every stone and tree and molecule of aught. Now that new and shoot was whole within me, I was connected to it all and I was about to destroy it all. No! I pushed up onto my knees and thrust my hand over my head, willing the most enormous ought structure I'd ever created into existence. The dome slammed into place, surrounding every part of the oasis within the encircling cliffs. I could feel the rocks crashing against its surface, some as big as buses, some even larger but I set the dome of solidified aught, and it held, even as my hand slipped away, as I fell back onto my side, 
as darkness seeped across my vision. It held. Part 7 Net Gerard Oasis, Egypt, Present Day. Chapter 43 Cat. And minutes later, when I woke, you were cradling me in your arms. And can I just say that nothing can give a hangover like a shoot explosion? I laughed out loud. Lex had been through so much, but it was like writing to Marcus was her outlet. And one way she'd learned to deal with all of the crazy was actually going crazy. My laugh faded quickly as I glanced down at the words filling the page. Marcus was going to be pissed when he found out about what Nguyen told Lex, that she might have to sacrifice herself to give the rest of us a chance, and that even if everything worked out, their kids would end up being god slaves to universal order for, like, ever. Lex had been gone for almost a month, and Marcus was slowly unraveling, not because of bonding withdrawals or anything like that, but because there seemed to be no end, no winding down of her adventures in the past. I thought he'd actually started to think that his past self had managed to find a way for Lex to live out the thousands of years separating us from her, and that this Marcus would have to wait 4,000 more years to ever see her again. It didn't even matter that it was impossible. And I was pretty sure Marcus didn't give a flying crapola about any of this apepset or ma'at stuff. All that mattered to him was Lex. Lex returning. Lex ridding herself of the chute poisoning her. Lex having twins. Staring at the words she'd inscribed so long ago, I let out a heavy sigh and stuck out my lower lip. Marcus might actually start caring about that bigger picture stuff now that both their fates and their unborn kids appeared to be zooming toward a brick wall, otherwise known as complete and utter destruction, if they failed. If they failed, we were all dead. My chest clenched, and I felt something wet on my cheek and hastily wiped it away. I was not crying. I wasn't. With a sigh, I turned the page and continued recording. At least the dome really did hold, and I really didn't kill everyone. My God, can you imagine? I'm having a hard enough time dealing with the fact that I killed four people, and that I hardly cared that I was killing them while I was doing it. It's sick and twisted and totally creepy and... It's definitely something that's going to haunt my dreams for years. Assuming we have years. Anyway, after the shoot explosion, Nikure wrapped Apep Ankinson Pepe's wrists in chains of Ot. He created an Ot dagger and held it flush against the front of her neck. Of course, when I opened my mouth to warn him that the threat of death was more like promising to fulfill Apep's deepest desires, Apep Unkinson Pepe slammed her head forward and slit her own damn throat. We're just lucky that Apep hasn't been able to do the same with Set. If Set didn't have a will of iron, but he does, so it's no use worrying about something that won't happen. Right, so Unkinson Pepe bled out, right in front of us, and a pep oozed out of her in all of his inky, oily glory and started toward me. Nguyen, or rather Ra, who had apparently been lying in wait in Nguyen's dead body, rose up in a sparkling, iridescent mist and rushed a pep, who chose to hide in the nearest person, Nejere or otherwise, rather than be subjected to whatever Ra could do to him in his now incorporeal state. As I'm sure you've guessed by now, the person Apep hid in was none other than Set, who immediately passed out. I frowned. I'd spent my whole life hating and fearing my dad. He was the monster under the bed, in the closet, and standing just outside, watching through the window. Hell, there were a bunch of times he probably had been standing just outside the window, 
watching me and mom. He'd always been such a creeper, which made it so damn weird to think that my real dad, the guy who gave me his genes, wasn't actually a bad guy. According to everything I'd read of Lex's, and I'd read a lot, he was kind of a sweetheart, and Lex was going to trap him, hold him prisoner in his own body for pretty much ever, as far as we knew, and that was the best case scenario. I swallowed repeatedly and cleared my throat. I would not freaking cry. I had a job to do, and it didn't include blubbering like a baby, damn it. Taking a deep breath, I continued writing. Ra, having no body and no incorporeal enemy to contend with, changed direction. He hovered around Nakure, who was completely baffled as to why the shimmering mist was doing that, until I told him that Ra, well, I said Nguyen to him, because I hadn't actually explained all that stuff about Nguyen actually being Ra, mythological arch-nemesis of a pep, blah, 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 was probably waiting for permission. Once Nakure understood, his face brightened with a smile, and he nodded. Personally, I wouldn't have been so eager to be possessed, but to each his own. Wait, what? I stared at the wall, at Lex's next words, my eyes wide and my mouth hanging open. No effing way. I blinked several times, then read her words out loud. We watched as Ra seeped into Nakure, and then he passed out too. I licked my lips and shook my head at the wall. Holy effing shitballs. I can honestly say that I didn't think it would be you, Nick said from the lone doorway out of the chamber. I yelped and flung my notebook and pen in the air. They landed just beyond my feet as I spun on my butt to face the intruder. Nick stepped into the room and raised his hand to the doorway. A sheet of what looked like liquid tin foil spread out from his palm, covering the opening in seconds. In a blink, it turned into pale, shimmering stone that matched the room's walls, ceiling, and floor. Not stone, I realized. Solidified ought. I shifted so my feet were under me now, and rose, slowly, like not making any fast movements might prevent Nick from doing whatever the hell he was planning to do that required a door of ought sealing us in. I backed away just as slowly until my back hit a wall. My heart pounded in my chest. He was still standing by the blocked doorway, watching me. His head was cocked to the side and a tiny smile curved his lips. What? What do you want? He shook his head and just kept on staring at me, wearing that knowing little smile. I won't tell anyone if that's what you're worried about. I mean, if you want me to keep it a secret that you're, you know, possessed. I cleared my throat. I, um, will. Nick's eyebrows rose, and he touched his fingertips to the front of his black t-shirt. Me? He shook his head and the corners of his mouth turned down in the slightest possible frown. I don't want anything from you. He does. He? I blinked several times. Nguyen? I mean, Ra? Why? I shook my head. I don't have anything. What could he possibly want from me? Nick grinned and closed his eyes for several seconds. When he opened them again, they were no longer pale blue, but the color of glimmering opals, his expression changed, becoming warm and kind and making Nick's face seem far less menacing and far more handsome. Katharina Dubois, he said, bowing his head. We have never actually met, though I have heard much about you, and I have seen you many times, through Nekure's eyes, of course, uh, he held his hands up in a placating gesture. 
I mean you no harm. I swear it. And Nick? He shrugged. I do not know his inner thoughts, only those he chooses to share with me. I swallowed. How reassuring. We do not have much time. What are you? Alexandra will be returning in a matter of minutes. How do you? A long time ago, she informed Nekure and myself of several occurrences that would herald her return to this time. Someone discovering the truth about me was the final sign, though she seemed to find great amusement in not telling us who that someone would be. I am certain that finding out that it's you will both disturb and intrigue Nekure greatly. He waved his hand dismissively. But that is of no matter right now. Alexandra will arrive momentarily. So why are we... You have a very important task, he said, interrupting me again. It was getting annoying. One that the fate of the universe depends on. I felt the color drain from my face. I was pretty sure I didn't have whatever it took to be one of those universe-depends-on-you kind of people. That was more Lex and Marcus's shtick, not mine. What? What do I have to do? Raw Nick smiled blissfully. You must find Heru. Alert him of Alexandra's arrival. Then hunt down Carson and... Carson? I frowned and tilted my head to the side. Why? I may have felt a teensy bit of pleasure in interrupting him that time. Raw Nick's cheek twitched. Because he is important as well. Together, the two of you will trigger a series of events that must be. Now you must. Does he know about you too? I couldn't hold in all of my grin at getting the chance to interrupt him again. Is that why Nick sort of hates him? Raw Nick strode toward the door of Ott and touched his hand to its surface. It evaporated almost immediately. There is no time to explain. He stepped to the side of the doorway. Go. Now, Katharina. Eyes wide and heart beating too quickly. Lex is returning. I pushed off the wall and ran past Raw Nick toward the doorway. I wasn't sure if it was my imagination, but I may or may not have heard him murmur something that sounded an awful lot like, I am sorry. Chapter 44 Lex There, I said as I pulled my fingertips from Heru's forehead. It is done. I smirked just a little and I promise to let you shatter the bonding block as soon as possible when I return to my time. I know how much you enjoy doing that. Heru didn't return my teasing smirk, and no mischief sparkled in his eyes. There, only sadness shone, pure and bright. He cupped either side of my jaw, tilting my face upward, and gazed into my eyes, searching, asking, pleading. Alexandra, little queen. His voice was soft, his touch tender. You do not need to do this. The bonding block, that was necessary. But my memories of you, I need them. The thought of not knowing. We were surrounded by an ocean of sand, about a mile from the oasis, which was now covered in an ought dome, and a mound of limestone rubble. The rest of our people awaited us just out of sight, or rather, they awaited him. I would not be returning with him. I would not be traveling back across the red land to Mennefer with Heru and the rest of his family, would not watch his children grow up, 
would not be a part of his life for thousands of years. I smiled the saddest smile. But you do not need your memories of me, not yet, and you will not miss them because you will not know of them. But I want to keep them, he said somberly. My smile turned bitter. There is a great difference between want and need, I said, echoing something he'd told me thousands of years in the future, in Seattle, just before walking me home for the first time. Heru's eyes were filled with a plea, but he didn't ask again. Standing on tiptoes, I brushed my lips across his and whispered, I love you, my Heru, so very, very much, and before you know it, I will be standing in front of you, unsealing your memories of my time here, right before I reached into his mind and locked every single memory of me, of all that had happened since my arrival, behind an impenetrable wall, replacing them with his own version of the same, vague recollections I'd given to everyone else, everyone except Aset, Nekure, and the three hot whore priestesses, of course. Heru pulled away and eyed me quizzically. Apologies, he shook his head, a tiny confused smile tugging one corner of his mouth. I do not know, he cocked his head to the side. Do I know you? No, I said, taking a step back. The single word was thick with emotion, so I cleared my throat. But one day, you will know me. My eyes stung with unshed tears as I pointed to a nearby sand dune. Your family, Sesha and your children, await you just beyond the crest. You should rejoin them. My, my family. Heru's eyes searched mine, and his face fell. Bonifer, Torset, they are gone. I had to fight the urge to reach out to him, to comfort him. He no longer knew me, and doing so would only upset and confuse him further. I am very sorry for your loss, Heru. I truly am. Swallowing roughly, I gestured toward the dune. Your family needs you now. You should go to them. Yes. Brow furrowed. He studied me for a moment longer then turned and ascended the dune. At the top, he looked over his shoulder, meeting my eyes one last time, and then he was gone. I felt like my heart had been ripped out of my chest, just as a pep had threatened to do weeks ago. I closed my eyes, allowing a single tear to escape, then took a deep breath and shifted back to just outside the broken oasis, where Aset Nakure and the priestesses were waiting for me. I re-entered the physical plane in a poof of misty colors directly in front of the mouth of a new tunnel, the only way through the rubble and into the covered city. Aset and Nakure were standing off to the side, speaking quietly to the priestesses. From the snippets I caught as I approached, I surmised that they were solidifying their story of what happened over the past month, making sure everything was in sync so there wouldn't be any inconsistencies to raise eyebrows. I reached into the folds of my desert robe as I approached them, pausing to scratch Russ's head before pulling a small, rolled-up sheet of papyrus from the tiny drawstring purse tied to my belt. I handed it to a set and met her eyes. You must give this to me. After you find me in Cairo, you will know when I need you by watching Set. I glanced at Nakure. You are certain you can break through Set's cloak in my time, even when the Ot has been made unstable by the nothingness? Smirking, Nakure nodded. I have always been stronger than Set. I frowned, worrying my bottom lip. And... You are absolutely certain that he does not know of your shoot, that a pep won't be able to glean that from his mind. I'd blocked both Set's and a pep's memories of me, 
just as I'd done to everyone else. But I hadn't thought to search for anything relating to Nakure's unusual parentage. Again, Nakure nodded. He believes me to be Heru's first son, the product of a pre-manifestation affair with a woman from the Cold Lands, while Heru and my mother were traveling in the north. I nodded. Good. It must remain that way. I turned my attention back to Aset. I do not know how long it will take for Apep to take control of Set's body, so you must be wary of him. I believe Set will remain Set for quite some time, but when you see the darkness in his eyes, you will know that Apep is in control, and you must remember always that even when Apep is not in control, he can see and hear everything Set sees and hears. We understand, Aset said. Good. Again, I gave a single nod. In the far future, when Apep leaves Set to possess Heru, then you must come to the location written here. I handed her a second piece of rolled up papyrus. It will not make sense to you yet, but in time. There is also a second place and time on there. It is when and where we will first meet in my native timeline. Before then, you must gain a position as a healer at the establishment I wrote down, and you must be there on the night listed. Aset nodded. I understand. And Aset, I reached for her hand and took a deep breath. I'm going to ask you something, and I need you to answer honestly. Her eyes widened the smallest amount. It was not Nguyen who rescued you from Nakure's father, was it? The tiniest smile curved her lips. It was not. I released her hand. Because it was me. Yes, dear friend. Her smile widened. It was you. And surprising me, she produced her own rolled sheet of papyrus, no bigger than a cigar. Directly before you return to your time, you must read this. My eyebrows rose. What is it? I asked as I started to break the gold seal. Aset placed her hand over the papyrus roll, stopping me. Not yet. You must read this only when you are about to leave. She flashed her trademark warm smile. Trust me. Only when I nodded did she pull her hand away. Okay. I turned to Nakure. Is Nguyen... I shook my head. Is Ra still out of commission? Because I really would have preferred to speak to him before I left. But I suppose it didn't make much difference whether I spoke to him before leaving this time or right after returning to my own. So it seems, Nakure said. I can feel him, but he has yet to attempt to communicate with me. He shook his head. I do not know how long it will take. Apologies, Lex. I touched his arm and offered him a smile. It is no fault of yours. What you did for him was very honorable. And a great sacrifice, I didn't say. Taking a step closer to him, I wrapped my arms around his trim torso in a tight hug, then did the same with a set. I will miss you both. Not as much as we will miss you, I think, Aset squeezed me back. But we will meet again. This we know. After we finished our goodbyes, I watched Aset, Nikure, and the priestesses walk into the desert, following the path Heru and the rest of the Nezirets and their families had taken only a few hours earlier. Aset was speaking animatedly to Denai, giving her instructions on what her new secret Hathur cult must do to prepare for the events that would happen in thousands of years, leading me to coming here. Only once they were out of sight did I retreat into the tunnel that led through the limestone rubble covering the dome. I sealed off the entrance with a door of Ott that could only be triggered by the combination of both Heru's and my bonding pheromones, then made my way down the tunnel and headed toward Heru's palace to say goodbye to Torset. The oasis, 
more like a cavern now, felt like an eerie, desolate husk, absent of the life it had teemed with only hours ago. But one day, in the distant future, I thought we might be able to resurrect Nguyen's glorious city. It would be a fitting tribute to the long life Ra had spent on Earth as Nguyen, the great father and creator of my people. I moved through the empty rooms of Heru's palace like a ghost, touching nothing, feeling empty. When I entered the children's room in the back of the palace, Tarset still looked like a sculpture of a sleeping child, lying on her bed. Pulling a sleepy Russ out from his sling under my desert robes, I placed him on the bed beside the little girl. He stretched, yawned, and turned in a circle before curling up against her arm. I couldn't bring him with me. Traveling through time would, quite literally, tear him apart. But I could offer him his own form of time travel, just as I'd done to give Tarset a fighting chance. See you soon, little guy, I said as I scratched the top of his head. He blinked lazily, then rested his chin on his front paws and closed his eyes. A moment later, he was as still and solid, as eternal as Tarset. I smiled, finding comfort in knowing that Heru's youngest daughter wouldn't be alone during the long millennia. Glancing around, I imagined how the room might look in 4,000 years, and all I could picture was inches and inches of dust and cobwebs, and I couldn't allow that. Not on Tarset, and Russ's stone-like bodies. Leaning over the little girl, I pressed my lips to her forehead and whispered, Sleep well, little fig. I cleared my throat roughly, tears welling in my eyes. I'll see you soon, too. As I pulled away, I transformed the bed into solidified ought so it wouldn't collapse over the millennia and spread a thin layer of ought over it. No dust, no spider or anything else would touch her or Russ while they lay there, frozen in time. After leaving Heru's palace, I sealed myself in my underground sanctuary, spending a few hours adding one final room that described the events that had taken place the previous afternoon. Sealing off the door to the scandalous domed chamber, I would let Marcus read those words once I'd returned, and creating a life-size statue of myself as one final gift to Marcus. When I was finished, I stopped by the altar in the burial chamber, as it truly was a burial chamber now, and spent a few minutes fussing with Nguyen's linen wrappings, making sure they were just so, before I formed a clear sheet of ought over him as well. He was too wondrous to hide from the world, but too special to allow anyone to have free access to his body. And somehow, perhaps it was another of the strange snippets of information I was able to glean from the shoot now that it was whole within me, I knew that his body would remain as it was for all eternity. Time would not, could not, touch one such as him. I will see you again, I murmured, my hand pressed against the ought just over his heart. And then, turning away, I pulled my desert robe over my head, leaving the linen in a heap in the corner of the room, knowing it would be long gone by the time Marcus found this place, and removed a set's note from my small purse. I broke the seal and started to read the precise hieroglyphs. I fear you will be angry with me when you read this, but it is what must be. That is all that matters. Know that because of what you are about to do, wherever you go, wherever you are, so long as Nakure and I are still alive, we will be there to help you along the way. Before you return to your time, you must go back even further to rescue me and return me to my brother. And before you leave that time, you must give me this message to pass on to Nguyen, as he will be in another time while you are there. Great Father, my name is Alexandra Larson, the Meswet you seek. 
My mother is Alice, daughter of the Netjerat Alexander and the granddaughter of the Netjerat Ivan, and my fathers are the Netjerat Set and the Netjer Apep. I am Hathor, your wife and bondmate to Heru. Find me, old friend, protect me, and Ma'at will be restored to the universe, for this is what has always been and will always be. I am not positive on the exact wording, but all of that must be said. Nguyen receiving this message is the moment that sets the course for the next six thousand years, so make sure you do not err. Good luck, my dear friend. I shall see you again soon. I stared at Asset's words and shook my head slowly. She was wrong. I wasn't angry with her. I was stunned. Thinking about making my first purposeful jump through time was intimidating enough. But now I had to do it twice. And I didn't even know when or where I was supposed to go. My hands started to shake, making the papyrus rattle softly. And I knew myself well enough to know that if I didn't try right now, I'd lose my nerve and never try at all. And then this room would become my tomb as well as Nguyen's. Get it together, Lex. I rolled up the papyrus and returned it to my little drawstring purse. You can do this. I thought of Tarset and of Marcus and my mom and dad and Set and Jenny and her unborn baby and all of the other people in my time who were depending on me. And then I thought of a set and what she was going through right now in some distant past time. And as my resolve solidified, my hands stopped shaking. Holding my head high, I kept my focus locked on a set, on saving her, and walked straight into the nearest wall and out of time completely. I re-entered time stumbling and gasping before I even had a chance to orient myself to the sudden silvery light or the rushing, roaring sound all around me. I ran into a warm, hard, and oh-so-familiar-smelling body crouching directly in front of me. Shit, I hissed as I tripped, skittered backward, and landed on my butt on soft, wet sand. The back of my head connected with a small rock, with a sickening crack, and stars filled my vision, joining the brilliant night sky that blazed overhead. Something cool and sharp was suddenly pressed against the front of my neck, and Heru's face appeared about a foot above mine. At least, I was pretty sure it was Heru. His spicy scent was exactly like Heru's, and his face resembled Heru's almost exactly, but not quite. He looked younger, softer, more human, I realized. And then it dawned on me, because he was more human. He had to be, if I'd really made it back to the time of Aset's attack and abduction, when Aset had been taken, she'd yet to manifest, which meant... The same was true for her twin, Heru. Who are you, and what are you doing here? He whispered in the original tongue, the low sound harsh. He shot a quick glance around. And where did you come from? I rubbed the back of my head and slowly sat up, pushing against his dagger blade with my neck. He let up just enough to allow me to sit fully and took a position squatting in front of me. When I pulled my fingers away from my throbbing skull, they were sticky with warm blood. Being assaulted by you, apparently, I muttered, only answering his second question, and even then, only answering partially. Using a move he'd taught me, I took hold of his wrist and twisted sharply, forcing him to drop the weapon and knowing full well that were he any older or more experienced, it wouldn't have worked. And you do not need that, Heru. I released his wrist. I am here to rescue your sister. Heru moved away from me quickly, retrieving his dagger before standing. He eyed me warily. Sighing, 
I touched the back of my head again and swept my gaze over the moonlit landscape. Ocean waves beat against sand a short ways to my right, the water as dark as midnight, and to my left, gentle slopes of pale sand spread out as far as I could see. The waves, at least, explained the rushing, roaring sound I'd heard. As far as I could tell, we were somewhere in the northern African coast, with the Mediterranean Sea to one side and the Sahara to the other. Narrowing my eyes, I returned Heru's measuring stare. What are you doing here? At least the ache in the back of my skull was already receding. He straightened. Rescuing my sister. Hmm. I hadn't expected to find him there, despite it making sense that he would go after his sister. Recalling something Aset had told me when recounting her tale, I scanned Heru's body. Not that I could see much under the ankle-length, black linen robe he was wearing. You are injured. Where? Are you all right? Heru's eyes widened, and his free hand moved to touch the lower left side of his ribcage. I am fine. How did you... He shook his head. How do you know who I am? How do you know about my sister? I exhaled heavily and pushed up to my feet. Brushing off my backside, I met his eyes. It is a long story, and one that we do not have time for now. I glanced out at the inky sea, then back at the endless desert. Do you know where a set has been taken? He nodded, his eyes flicking to some point behind me. I shot a quick glance over my shoulder. A rocky outcropping jutted up toward the night sky, several miles away. There is a cave. I believe he has her there. I rubbed my hands together and stretched my neck from side to side, mentally preparing for whatever disturbing scene I might find inside this cave. Is it just the two of them, do you know? Or are there others? Heru shook his head. I took care of the others back at the oasis when he first took her. I see. Not willing to wait any longer, I said, wait here. I shall return with your sister shortly. What? Heru stared at me. But I should not. Before he could finish, the misty, swirling colors of the aught surrounded me, and I jumped from the peaceful, moonlit beach to a cavern that could have been inhabited by the devil himself. A single campfire lit pale, jagged walls with writhing streaks of orange and yellow, making the stone appear almost on fire itself. A sharp shriek cut through the crackle of burning wood, closely followed by a low, menacing laugh. On the cavern floor, on the other side of the fire, a small, nude woman huddled, curled in on herself, and a larger, masculine figure loomed over her, his back to me. Please, Aset gasped. No more. She hugged her knees to her bare chest in what was clearly a desperate attempt to protect herself. Rage boiled in my blood, and my hands curled into fists. Your depths of depravity never cease to amaze me, I said through gritted teeth. Aset's captor spun around, pulling an obsidian dagger from his woven leather belt and licking his lips. Hunger gleamed in his dark eyes. Who are you? He hissed, taking a step toward me. I sneered, even possessing a nejere. He stood about as much chance against me, against Ra's shoot, as an ant. You are pathetic, Apep. He stumbled, then stopped, his mouth hanging open and his eyes shining with outrage. Laughing, I raised my hand, and just as I'd done to Onkinson Peppy, called forth vines of aught. They burst up from the cavern floor and snaked around Apep's legs, restraining him. You disgust me. If I could erase you from existence. But I couldn't. And as awful as it was to admit, even if I could, I wouldn't. His lips retracted, and he snarled. 
I ignored his little outburst. But you are needed in the future. I crossed my arms over my chest. So all I can do is take young Aset away from you and erase all of your memories of her and what you have done to her and all memory of me, of course. I scanned him from head to toe, recalling something else Aset had included in her tale. And your host body's memories as well, since he invited you to possess him in the first place. I smiled, feeling the spirit of vengeance fill me, keeping me calm, helping me focus. And I think I shall leave you trapped in that body for a little while longer. I willed the ot vines to climb higher, capturing his arms and trapping them against his body before stepping closer. Raising my hand, I touched my fingertips to Apep's forehead, preparing to erase both Apep and his host's memories. It is a fitting punishment that your freedom will mean his death. But it is not enough, I think. I shall add some memories of intense pain as well. Though I fear that, too, will not be enough. Nothing will change what must come. A pep started to writhe in his ought bindings, as I did as I'd promised, and even through the chill that had slowly been seeping into my soul, I found pleasure in his tormented grunts and cries, which probably should have bothered me, but in the thrall of the chill, the oneness, it didn't. Please, do not hurt me, Aset whimpered, her voice small and shrill. I shifted my focus to her, and the oneness shattered. Moving toward her slowly, I held out my hands and spoke to her, keeping my voice low, my tone calm. I will not hurt you, Aset. I crouched in front of her, but made no move to touch her. Your brother is waiting for you outside, just a short ways up the beach. I will take you to him. It... Heru? You saw Heru? She raised her head, meeting my eyes for the first time. Her own widened. Oh my, your eyes are like the Great Father's. I offered her a small smile and nodded. Yes, they are. And I came here to rescue you because he was away and could not do it himself. I glanced over my shoulder at the shuddering form of a pep's host body. He will not bother you again. I swear it. Her eyes lingered on the forbidding man, still held upright by the ought vines restraining him, then settled back on me. She blinked several times, tears welling in her eyes and her chin trembling. And when I reached out a hand to give her shoulder a gentle squeeze, she threw herself at me, shuddering and sobbing. She clung to me like I was the only thing keeping her alive. I held her tightly and rubbed her back in slow circles. She was so small, so fragile, it seemed, and it amazed me to think of the strong, graceful woman she would become. Eventually, she quieted, and I helped her to her feet. Do you have any clothing? She shook her head, her eyes flicking to the fire. He burned my dress. I sighed, my own eyes landing on a rough, woven blanket. Retrieving it quickly, I wrapped it around her shoulders, along with my arm, and guided her toward the narrow, uneven mouth of the cave. Neither of us glanced back at her abductor. How did you know to come? She asked, once we were out of the stifling cave and under the stars. I laughed softly. Now that is quite a story. I think I would very much like to hear a story right now, I said softly. I would like to think about anything else but what he did to me. I squeezed her shoulders, my heart bleeding for her. 
Very well. In about a thousand years. Must you go? Aset asked as we neared the place where I'd left her brother. The sand was soft and cool under our bare feet, and she seemed both awed and soothed by my fantastical tale of what was to come. I nodded. I must. I could just make out the outline of Heru, maybe a half mile away, though I knew he wouldn't be able to see us yet, and I wanted to leave before I had a chance to complicate our relationship any further than it already was. Stopping, I turned to face Aset and captured both of her hands. You cannot tell Heru or any others what I have told you. I gave her hands a squeeze. You must promise me. She blinked in surprise, but nodded. Frowning, she said, What about the Great Father? Surely he must already know of you and what is to come. I bit my lip, my eyebrows drawing together. I do not think so. Taking a deep breath, I pulled the piece of papyrus. A set had given me a millennium in the future out of my satchel and unrolled it. You must tell him this and only this, I said, and then I relayed her own future words to her, paraphrasing only a little. My name is Alexandra Larson, and I am the Mezwet you seek. My mother is Alice, daughter of the Netjerot Alexander and granddaughter of the Netjerot Ivan, and my fathers are the Netjerot Set and the Netjer Apep. I am Hathor, your wife. I watched Aset's eyes widen, and bondmate to Heru. Her mouth fell open. I smiled just a little. Find me, old friend, protect me, and Ma'at will be restored, for this is what has always been and will always be. I paused, studying her pretty, stunned face. Do you need me to repeat it? She quirked her mouth to the side, clearly unsure. You will not be able to find this moment in the ought to rehear it, even after you've manifested, so... Abruptly, she nodded. Then, yes, repeat it once more. I shall remember. I did as she requested. Then, once again, took hold of her hands. There is one more thing you must know. You will be with child, from what that Netjerat did to you. She didn't look surprised, much to my surprise. That was what he wanted. Ah, I understood. You must tell Nguyen that I said that the child is not to be harmed, that he must be allowed to live, though under the guise of being Heru's firstborn, rather than yours. Can you do that? Wide-eyed, she nodded. Good. I gave her hands a squeeze before releasing them. In many years, there will be a pharaoh named Pepi Neferkare. On the day of his funeral procession, I will jump through time to arrive at a temple run by priestesses of the cult of Hat Hor in Men Nefer. Hat Hor? Aset stared at me quizzically and shook her head. This is you, correct? I nodded, if a bit hesitantly, though I wasn't sure why. After all, I had just told her to tell Nguyen that I was Hat Hor. But I prefer Lex. There is no temple cult devoted to you yet. I shivered, feeling like someone had just walked over my grave. Then you must ensure that one exists by the time I arrive. Aset nodded slowly. Yes, I believe I can do this. And remember, when I arrive, I will not know you. Not really. Because all that you have told me has not happened yet. For that younger version of you, Aset said, accepting it all a whole lot better and more quickly than I had. Aset, Heru called. Peering over Aset's shoulder, I could see Heru running along the beach toward us. I met Aset's eyes. 
I must go before he sees enough of me that I must erase his memory. Very well. Unexpectedly, Aset leaned in and wrapped her arms around me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Her body shook as she spoke. You cannot know how much I appreciate what you have done. My life is yours. But do not forget, Aset, I whispered. It is also yours. Pulling back, I smiled down at her. Aset! Heru was only several dozen paces away. Farewell, I said, right before hurtling myself into the yacht, body, ba, and all, thinking only of the oasis and of my own time. Dizzily, I staggered out of the yacht and into Nguyen's crystalline sarcophagus. He looked just as I'd left him, what felt like such a short time ago, his features glowing in a soft incandescence, in a semblance of peace, of sleep. For a moment, as I stared at his familiar, unusually relaxed features, I thought it hadn't worked, and I'd returned to the oasis at the end of the Sixth Dynasty, instead of my own native time. Welcome home, Lex. I spun around, making my time travel vertigo even worse. A trim man dressed all in black, with black hair, multiple facial piercings, and an amalgam of tattoos in various shades of gray covering his exposed arms, stood in the doorway to the right of Nguyen's altar. Nakure, I breathed, right before my knees gave way, and I lost consciousness. Chapter 45 Reunite and Unite Opening my eyes, I found Nakure's handsome face hovering over mine. His eyes were the palest blue, shining with a mixture of concern and excitement. Hey, I whispered. Marcus? On his way. I raised my hand, touching my fingertips to his pierced eyebrow. I like you better without all this, you know. He grinned and briefly raised his eyebrows. It's camouflage. Blinking, I slid my gaze down to his tattooed forearm. How long do they last? He glanced down at his arm and shrugged. A couple years at most. I narrowed my eyes and focused on a sliver of abdomen visible between the bottom hem of his t-shirt and the top of his black jeans, where his shirt had hiked up a bit. It was dark with ink. I raised my eyebrows. And I suppose you're going to tell me those are for camouflage, too? Not exactly. His grin became lopsided. Come on, Lex. My mom gives me enough grief about this shit. I don't think I could handle it from you, too. I laughed, and then I groaned. God. I feel like crap. Yeah, Raw says that's normal after your first back-to-back, -back unaided time jumps, especially two huge-ass ones. With another groan, I propped myself up on my elbows, and Nikure helped me the rest of the way up, settling my back against the wall. Somehow, I doubt that he said huge-ass. Chuckling, he lifted one shoulder in a quick shrug. He also says your access to the chute might be weak for a bit, which could be a problem because now that it's complete within you, a pep will be able to sense it. He paused, then added, he'll be drawn to it. Squeezing my eyes shut, I took a deep breath, then squinted at Nakure, which means he'll be on his way right? Nakure nodded. Can I talk to Ra? Yeah. He flashed me another grin, this one holding nothing but mischief. He's been waiting for me to hand over control anyway. Impatient fucker. Nakure, I said with a laugh. Chuckling again, he leaned in and pressed a gentle kiss against my forehead. Welcome back, Lex. 
you're in for one hell of a ride. As he pulled away, he closed his eyes. When they opened again, they were no longer pale blue, but filled with a glimmering iridescence of opals. He smiled again, but it was entirely different from an Akure's. I knew this smile. Those eyes. They belonged to Nguyen, to Ra. Hello again, dear Alexandra, he murmured. My chin trembled, and I swallowed, my saliva suddenly feeling too thick, my esophagus too narrow. I wasn't sure. I mean, I saw you go into him, I shook my head, but I wasn't sure. Ah, but I would not abandon you. Ra Nakure leaned in, but instead of pressing his lips against my forehead, he brushed them across my own lips in a purely platonic kiss. His lip ring felt hard and cool compared to the soft, warm flesh. Closing my eyes, I smiled. He was really there, inside Nakure, not dead. Get away from, Dominic started to say, but his words cut short as Ra Nakure pulled away from me, because Ra Nakure had stretched out his arm and was holding an ot blade to Dominic's neck. Careful, boy. Dominic's eyes widened, but not from the razor-sharp blade nearly slicing into his flesh. He was staring at me. Legs, your eyes. I looked away feeling embarrassed for some reason I didn't understand. Stop it, I said to Ra Nakure, reaching out to unmake the blade, but despite my best effort, the knife refused to disappear. My eyes sought out Ra Nakure's. Why isn't it working? He glanced at me. Just give it a moment to recharge. How long of a moment? An hour. Maybe two, he said. The knife evaporated into rainbow mist. As soon as he was no longer in danger of having his neck sliced open, Dominic elbowed Ra Nakure in the side of the face. Because of his near-constant facade of courtesy and kindness, it was easy to forget that Dominic had been a highly trained, highly skilled assassin several hundred years ago and was easily one of the deadliest people alive. Pulling a knife on him was a pretty dumb move for pretty much anyone to make. But then, considering that Ra Nakure was probably one of the few people who were even more deadly than Dominic, they were suddenly grappling on the floor, and all I could do was gape. Stop this at once, a set shouted from the top of the stairway, leading down to the burial chamber. No! Ra Nakure and Dominic froze. I swear, Aset said as she started down the stairs with a huff. Men, they're all boys, no matter what their age. She shook her head and shifted her gaze to me, her honey-colored eyes warming as she smiled. Legs, Aset. I clambered to my feet, using the wall because I was still a little unsteady, and threw my arms around her. Thank you so much. You did everything perfectly. I don't know how you managed, but you did. I let out a relieved laugh. Thank you. She placed her hands on my shoulders and, pulling back, looked up into my eyes. I only did what I must. She grinned. But you are welcome, of course. And then she blinked several times, turned her face to the stairs, and let go of me completely. I followed her line of sight. Marcus. He stood on one of the middle stairs, frozen, as he stared down at me. I could see the lump that had to be the ought bottle of bonding pheromones under his linen button-down shirt. He took the remaining stairs in two strides, and in another, his arms were around me, and his face was buried against my cheek, and he was shaking. His reaction paralyzed me, and I did the only thing I seemed able to do. I focused what little of the shoot I could control 
on the memories locked away in his mind and released them. Marcus stiffened, then slowly raised his head. He gazed down at me with round, wondrous eyes of molten gold and liquid onyx. Slowly, his lips spread into a broad smile. A chuckle started deep in his chest, quickly blossoming into a laugh. And then my back was against the wall, and he was kissing me, pressing his whole body against mine, and I didn't care one bit that three of my closest friends were standing nearby. Marcus's hands trailed down sides of my body before gliding behind my back, pulling me closer to him. And he did something I'd only experienced as a culmination of a sexual union between us. He slipped a tendril of his ba inside me, seeking my own, caressing my own. My nails dug into his lower back, pulling his hips as tight against mine as possible, and I moaned into his mouth. Pleasure rolled over me in waves. When he broke the kiss, I took several gasping breaths and leaned my head back against the wall. I stared up into his eyes and laughed breathily. Well, I think it's safe to say that you've stepped up your kissing game by light years. He leaned his forehead against mine. And that was just the smallest amount of my bar. He grinned. I wonder what will happen when I fill you with it completely. My entire body and my ba pulsed in anticipation. I can't wait to find out. Someone cleared a throat behind Marcus. I turned crimson. I'd forgotten about the others, standing in the altar room, watching us. Lex. I believe there are some people who would very much like to see you, Dominic said, his accent thick. Huh? I forced myself to take a step away from Marcus, a super small one, and to face Dominic. Who? His eyes scanned my face, then slid down the length of my body before focusing on Nguyen's sarcophagus. His pale cheeks flushed, and he cleared his throat. They are with Alexander and Jenny in the main palace, but I think you may wish to change into something a little more uh, substantial before seeing them. I glanced down at my simple, belted, white linen shift. What's wrong with this? Nothing, Asset said with a snort. It is the people of this time who are the problem. They are such prudes. She stepped around the altar and handed me a canvas tote bag. Clothes. I've had a long time to prepare for your return. She shrugged and made a shooing motion. Go. Change. We'll be out here. Hugging the bag, I wandered down one of the hallways I'd made thousands of years ago and entered the last room I'd created. Marcus followed. I hope you're not intending to have your way with me, I said lightly as I pulled clothing items out of the bag. There was a pair of khaki shorts, a white tank top, a thin ivory linen button-down shirt, a pair of tan lace-up work boots and socks, and, of course, undergarments. I stared at the bra and underwear like they were utterly foreign to me. Once again, assessed my current attire and, finally understood Dominic's words, and his blushes. The linen wasn't see-through, but it didn't come close to hiding everything either. Marcus's arms wrapped around me from behind, and he pressed himself against my backside. And here I thought you would be hoping for quite the opposite. His hand cupped my breast, his thumb doing very pleasant things. Stop that! I said, laughing as I twisted around in his hold. I peered up at him, studying the lines and angles of his face. Lines and angles I knew better than my own. I'm not about to meet a bunch of measurettes smelling like sex. Marcus brushed his knuckles down the side of my cheek. And if I tell you that you always smell like sex to me, like sex and love 
and everything that's good in the world. Does that change your mind? My cheeks, neck, and chest heated again. Marcus's easy expression melted, and worry filled his eyes. My stomach dropped. What? I searched those golden depths for some hint of what he was about to reveal. What is it? The people Dom was referring to aren't Nejarets. I raised my eyebrows. There are humans here? I mean, besides Jay and Jen? Marcus said nothing for a moment, then nodded. Susan Ivanov. My mouth fell open. My grandma's here? He nodded again. As are your parents. Chapter 46 Want and Need Crossing my arms, I narrowed my eyes at Marcus. Do they know? He nodded, and the blood drained from my face. My parents knew about me, about what I really was. They knew that I wasn't human. I fought the urge to panic, which wasn't easy because it was a really damn persistent urge. You brought them here, I said quietly. Again, Marcus nodded. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes for a long moment. I will not panic and I will not freak out. I will not. I clenched my jaw. I can't believe you told them. Marcus released me, letting me step back and start to change my clothes. It was impossible not to once they were here. Not an explanation, just a statement. I took another deep breath. I unclasped my belt and set it carefully on the floor. Another deep breath. And you brought them here because... I decided that them alive and fully aware of what you are would be a preferable situation for you to return to than Apep having slain them using your father's hands, he said matter-of-factly. I glanced at him, unsurprised to find a hard, challenging glint in his eyes. I looked away as I tugged my dress over my head. I could practically feel Marcus's eyes raking over my bare skin. Thank you, I said, meeting his eyes for the briefest moment and letting him see that I meant it. I don't know what I would have done. I swallowed back unnecessary sorrow for what could have been and forced myself to meet his burning eyes, to hold that gaze. Thank you, Marcus. Really. His jaw clenched and his nostrils flared. Make a door, little Ivanov, he said, his voice rougher than usual. He took a step toward me and started unbuckling his belt. I took a step backward, my heartbeat already speeding up from what he intended. But my family... His eyes narrowed, and he took another step, unfastening the top button of his trousers. Make a door. I took another step backward, and my back touched the cool wall. I was breathing faster now. But, but a pep. Make. Step. A. Step. Door. He was right in front of me, only inches away. He raised one eyebrow. I willed a door into being in the blink of an eye. But, Marcus caressed me with his gaze. You've been gone for a month, and the last time I saw you. He squeezed his eyes shut for a brief moment. When he opened them, they burned with torment. The last time I truly saw you, my hands were around your neck, holding you under water, and you were about to die. His eyes searched mine. I need to feel you, to know that you're really here, to know that you're still mine. I need you, Lex. But what if a pep tries to pos- He cannot possess me when I am surrounded by art. I blinked, 
then nodded, and not a second later, Marcus's pants were pushed down and my legs were wrapped around his hips, and I was experiencing the full depth of his need for me, of our need for each other. It was as brief and as intense of a joining as we'd ever shared, and by the end, when my ba tangled with his, something snapped inside me. I, my ba, felt like whatever threads had been tying it to my body, whatever resistance remained, holding it back from merging with Marcus's completely, broke, and I was inside him. I was a part of him. I could sense a pep's fractured shoot threaded through Marcus's very soul. I could feel how incomplete it was, and could imagine, knew, how beautiful and wondrous it would be if it were whole again. And I could practically see the tether stretching between Marcus and Set, who was miles and miles away to the east. Suddenly, the way to return that shoot to its former glory was so obvious, so easy. I tugged on the thin tether of shoot, a mere thread connecting the portion that was in Marcus to the portion Set's body contained. The latter resisted, and the tether groaned, stretched. Whatever it had been anchored to on Set's end snapped, and in a rush, the remainder of Apep's shoot funneled into Marcus, combining with the splinters already embedded in his ba and swelling to a glowing, pulsating mass of power. Gasping, I withdrew my ba from Marcus and stared into his stunned eyes, his glowing eyes, swirling with blues and greens and purples, just as mine did, only in every shade of red, orange, and yellow. A pep's shoot was whole, and it was all inside Marcus. He was breathing hard, his features locked in a mask of shock. Was that what I think it was? He asked, his voice hoarse. I nodded. A peps shoot. You have it all now. When my feet were once again planted on the floor, and we were both working on catching our breath, Marcus's lips quirked, curving into a wicked little smile. Then I guess the next few days will be quite busy, as we do everything we can to restore Ma'at. I pulled my head back a few inches and eyed him. You mean, start? trying to conceive? His little smile widened into an even more wicked grin. I must admit that I am so looking forward to this arduous challenge. Oh, yeah, um. I swallowed roughly and looked away. It was the first time we'd actually spoken about the whole kids thing. Wiggling out of his hold, I headed for my modern clothes. You know, I said, glancing back at him as he refastened his pants. He was watching me carefully. I never told you about that. The we can have kids thing back then. I do recall, he said. It was an interesting piece of information to learn from your writings. I pulled up my underwear. Are you mad? I mean, that I didn't tell you back then? He hesitated which terrified me. And then he frowned and shrugged. I'm not mad. I don't quite understand your reasoning, but I'm not mad. Watching his face for any hint of what he was feeling, I slipped my bra on, reaching behind me to fasten the clasp. As far as I could tell, he was being honest. So, um, how do you feel about it? I rolled my eyes at how lame the question had sounded, then snuck another peek at Marcus. The corners of his mouth twitched, and he raised his eyebrows. How do I feel about the fact that us having children is even possible? That it's the only way to prevent eternal divine powers from killing us? Or that our children might become beings even greater than Nejaret's, and be the only way to restore balance to the universe. I looked down at my shorts as I zipped them up. Um, the first one? 
Honestly, little Ivanov. Marcus tugged me into his arms before I had a chance to pull the tank top over my head. I have never, he kissed me, ever, kiss, been happier. He finished with a toe-curling, breath-stealing, ba-caressing kiss that had me panting and jelly-muscled all over again. Well, I stepped out of his hold and put on the tank top smoothing it down unnecessarily. I sent a longing glance at my discarded shift. I was going to miss dressing so comfortably. That's just... Great. I cleared my throat and felt my cheeks flush as I met his eyes. Are you planning on doing that every time we kiss from now on? A single eyebrow arched higher. Are you getting tired of it already? No, I just... My cheeks burned hotter, and I slipped my arms into the sleeves of the thin, button-down shirt. I would just appreciate it if you could, uh, restrain yourself whenever other people are around. I mean, I really have no problem climaxing every five minutes, if that's your goal, but I'd rather not have it happen in front of, oh, I don't know, my family. Marcus laughed out loud, but sobered quickly. He pressed a hand to his heart. I will try to show some restraint, but I must admit that I am quite fond of this idea of making you climax every five minutes. He grinned mischievously. Perhaps I shall set an alarm. I was kidding, I said with a laugh. His eyes glinted with promise. I wasn't. I gulped. I believe there is one item lacking from your current attire. Marcus reached behind his neck and worked the clasp of a thin silver chain that was hanging around his neck. Not, I realized, the chain that held the bottle of bonding pheromones I'd made for him. He pulled a large pendant out from the neck of his shirt. It was an ancient lapis lazuli falcon, a symbol of the god Heru, of him, that he'd given me a week or so before I stepped back in time, when we were still in Florence. I turned around for him to secure the delicate chain around my neck, and touched my fingers to the intensely blue pendant. Thank you, Marcus. He turned me back around and studied my face. And what about you, little Ivanov? How do you feel about the we can have kids thing? A tiny line appeared between his eyebrows. I know you have said that having children is not something you had ever planned on doing, even before you learned you could not. I let out a nervous laugh. Honestly? I'm scared shitless. I mean, they're going to be gods. Like, real, honest to God, gods. That's insane. And horrible. And wonderful. And terrifying. And... I shook my head. Marcus smiled, and I thought it might have been to hide a frown, so I kissed him, deeply. And when I broke the kiss, I added, but I'm also kind of ecstatic, and I meant it. Chapter 47 Beginning and End the entire time that Marcus and I were walking toward Nguyen's palace, Dominic, Nakure, and Asset behind us, and the harsh glow of artificial light all around us, my mind was occupied by two things, worrying about my impending reunion with my very human family, and noticing how things under the Ott Dome had changed, and how they'd stayed the same. But mostly I just worried and the moment I walked through the high, arched entryway into Nguyen's palace and into a huge room at the front that had been transformed into some sort of a communal dining hall with an eclectic mixture of mismatching ought tables and chairs, my eyes honed in on my mom, and I nearly lost it. Like, full-on, five-year-old girl who just skinned her knee lost it. It had been just over seven months since I'd seen her, 
a month of which had been spent in a time during which she didn't even exist, and I missed her desperately. She was sitting at a rectangular table with my dad, Jenny, Grandma Suze, and Alexander, and she hadn't noticed me yet. It took the room falling quiet for me to notice that there were even any other people in there, scattered among the various tables. A quick cursory scan told me they were all Nezurettes, and many were faces I recognized. They stared, and then they stood, and then they fell to their knees in supplication. I really hated that part of being the Mezwet. Only those who were members of my guard remained on their feet, and they rushed toward us. Marcus, Nakure, Aset, Dominic, and I were surrounded by a wall of Nezurettes of every size and skin and hair color within seconds, but I couldn't focus on any of them, not while I could hear her voice. Lex, my mom called. Lex, let me through, she demanded. Let her pass, I said. Valley and Sandra, the heads of my guard, parted, and my mom rushed into the ring of deadly Nezurettes. The rest of my family followed her, but she was the one who practically attacked me. Her arms were around me in an instant, and I was suddenly crying, though I didn't know why I was crying, other than that I was happy to be in my mom's arms. Maybe that was reason enough. Minutes passed before she pulled away with a, Well now, let me get a look at you. She scanned my face quickly, her eyes widening to saucers when they met mine. Your eyes, Lex, sweetie. She shook her head slowly, and there was a hint of something, fear, or maybe disgust, I wasn't sure, on her face. I really didn't believe until now, but you really have changed. You really are one of them, aren't you? Tears welled anew in my eyes. My mom had just referred to me as one of them, as something not the same as her, as something other. I swiped my fingers under my eyes angrily, refusing to shed tears for what I was, especially when I was only that because of genes she'd passed on to me. Being a Nezurette was nothing to be ashamed of. It was a great gift and a great curse, and it was what I was. I wouldn't have changed it if I could. I stood taller. Yeah, Mom, I'm one of them. But I'm also still me. My mom's mouth opened, shut. She arched her eyebrows. Like, I don't know who you are. Don't be ridiculous, Alexandra Marie Larson. I am your mother and you couldn't even bother to call me when you first became engaged with that man. She waved haphazardly at Marcus, who we'd never met, I might add. My shoulders sagged in relief, and I couldn't help but smile. Her reaction was so her, she eyed Marcus. I hope there's some actual affection here, and it's not just physical. Mom, I grabbed her arm. Oh my God, seriously, if you had any idea, any clue of what we've been through together. But I don't, do I? She said, her sharp tone one that only an irritated mother could achieve. And whose fault is that? Hmm? And now I felt guilty. I sighed. Mom, she leveled an even stare on me. You could have told me, Lex. You could have told me you were a... I don't know, a vampire or something insane like that, and I would have believed you. You would not have, she rolled her eyes. Okay, no, I wouldn't have believed you, but I would have listened, and I would have loved you anyway. You know now, Marcus said simply, earning both my mom's and my glances. Is that not enough? I held my breath. Her response mattered more than I was willing to admit, even to myself. Of course it is, she said in a rush. I just wish you'd told me you were going through all this, that you'd fallen in love, that's all. 
I rubbed my hand over my face and, of all things, started laughing. I'm in love, I said between laughs. Again, I glanced at Marcus, sending him a questioning look. And engaged, he shrugged. I made a note to ask him about everything that had happened with my family and about our apparent impending wedding. Like we could never be wedded together any more completely than we already were. My mom moved aside so the rest of my family could greet me. It was hardly dignified and filled with a chorus of sniffles and a rainstorm of tears and loads of murmured nonsense. But Grandma Sousa's reaction to my eyes was my favorite. Well, would you get a look at those peepers? She glanced back at Alexander, who was standing just behind her, reminding me so much of Heru with Bunafer, which only made me choke back less happy tears. Alexandra Larson, I think there's an entire son living in your head. I laughed. That's the least of my problems, Grandma. But before Grandma Suze or anyone else had a chance to interrogate me, Nephi pushed through the ring of guards, making our inner circle that much more crowded. So it's true, she said, her caramel eyes meeting mine. She bowed her head gracefully. I'm so glad you have returned and that you knew how to save my father. For that, I can never thank you enough. My eyebrows rose. Nephi? Seriously? She raised her eyes to mine and grinned, and I couldn't help but return her smile. You are so full of it. Her eyes sparkled. My grin faded as I remember why I'd been so eager to see her. Tarset. I glanced at Marcus. Did you tell her about what I did to Tarsi? About the poison and me freezing her in time? He shook his head. We'd yet to transcribe that from your writings, and without my memory. He turned an irritated look on Asat and Nakure, who were still behind me. Someone could have apprised me of the situation, or at least let me know that Tarset is still alive. Asat tisked. Don't be ridiculous. You had enough to deal with, dear brother. And Tarsi is fine as she is for now. Once things settle, we'll move her to the Cairo Palace. Lex can unfreeze her, and Nephi and I will treat her. She was right. At the moment, we didn't have time to take care of Tarset, who would be fine in her frozen state, or to unfreeze Russ either, because a pep set was on his way drawn to me, and now likely to Marcus as well, because of the shoots that were finally whole within us. I turned to Marcus. I need to speak to everyone. Can you get their attention? I glanced around at the guards, still encircling us. And is this really necessary? Pretty much everyone here is sworn to me. I doubt any of them are going to harm me. Looking over my head, Marcus nodded at someone. A quick glance over my shoulder told me it was Valley, the enormous, blonde, image of an ideal Viking of a man. As the guards spread out behind me and around the high-ceilinged room, Marcus helped me step onto a rather plain ought chair, and then onto a small, round table. Murmuring and whispers filled the room, quieting as soon as I held my hand up in front of me. I cleared my throat but it did nothing for the herd of horses galloping around in my chest. I, uh, I glanced at Marcus, who smiled encouragingly and nodded as he joined me on the table. Taking a deep breath, I tried again. This last month, I've been living over 4,000 years in the past, during the time of the Great Father's death. Stunned silence filled the room. I traveled into the past so I could learn to use the power Nguyen bestowed upon me and upon Marcus and Set to resolve an issue that has been thousands and thousands of years in the making. Ma'at, universal balance is deteriorating, and if it goes unchecked for too long, 
then the universe and everything in it will unravel into raw, unbridled chaos. I glanced at Nakure, whose eyes still shimmered with Ra's opalescence. He nodded. I took a deep breath, then another, and then I shared some of what I'd learned from Nguyen about the long, complicated history of the universe, of Ra and Uphep, and how Ra had taken Uphep's power and had been reborn as Nguyen to prevent Uphep from unmaking everything. I scanned the assembled crowd of Nezirets. But this was only a bandage on the wound, and Ma'at was still slowly failing, which is how we find ourselves to be in the situation we're in today. Glancing at Marcus, I reached for his hand. Marcus and I can restore Ma'at, thanks to Nguyen and everything he taught me, but there's one more hurdle we have to jump over before we can begin the process. I paused, taking a deep, calming breath. A pep is on his way here now, by means of Set's body. Murmurs and whispers broke out, and when Marcus's silence failed, I did the only thing I could think of. I shifted to a table in the center of the room. It was pushing the limits of what I could manage, shoot-wise, at the moment, but it was enough. When I reformed, there was absolute, complete silence and all eyes were on me. I stared around the cavernous room, packed with amazed Nezirets, sitting and standing in nearly every available space. When Set arrives, he must not be killed. We'll trap him and hold Uphep prisoner in his body until the process of restoring Ma'at is complete. And then we'll let Ma'at deal with Uphep in whatever way is necessary to retain universal balance. I paused, waited, let my words sink in. But first, we have to trap him. Do you hear that? Someone whispered, then another, and another. It sounds like helicopters. They were right. I could hear it too, now that I was paying attention. The steady thrum, thrum, thrum of far-off helicopter blades. I spun around, staring wide-eyed at Marcus. It's him, isn't it? Marcus nodded, his face grim, and strode across the room toward the table I was standing on. Why I'd assume a pep set would come in cars, that it would take him hours to get to the underground oasis, was beyond me. But I had. And... Now we were out of time. A minute frown curved Marcus's lips downward, and a crease appeared between his eyebrows. You're bleeding. He touched my shin, and his fingertips brought a tiny sting. I glanced down to see a minuscule cut. Huh. I didn't even notice. And then I frowned, too. A cut that small should have healed already. Marcus pulled his hand away, his fingertips stained with a smudge of crimson. Unless your regeneration is being suppressed because you've already reached the bonding pheromone saturation point, he frowned, which would mean you're now fertile. I nodded slowly. Nguyen had claimed as much, but I would hadn't known for sure. I guess I thought it would be more... Climactic. Marcus grinned. I can't imagine anything being more climactic. His expression sobered, and he brushed the backs of his fingers down the side of my leg. Concern shone in the multi hued depths of his eyes. You must be careful now, little Ivanov. Do not injure yourself, because you won't regenerate. I swallowed roughly suddenly feeling both fragile and vulnerable. He turned away abruptly and held his hand up to help me down from the table. Come, Alexandra, I will take you somewhere safe, somewhere where Set will not find you while I deal with him once and for all. I started to reach for his hand, 
but drew back before our fingers touched. Marcus never called me Alexandra. My stomach dropped into a pool of dread. The last time his lips had uttered those syllables, he'd been possessed by a pep. It's not possible. Lex, Dominic shouted. I turned around to see him rush into the dining hall between two sleek columns, his arm outstretched and a cell phone in his hand. Get away from Marcus, now. I spun around to stare at Marcus. His irises still shimmered with vibrant colors, but there was something else, something new. Mixed with the blues and violets and greens was a sickeningly familiar, inky darkness. Chapter 48 Deception and Conception No matter how impossible it seemed, no matter how much I didn't want to believe it, a pep had somehow found a way into Marcus's body. Without warning, the world froze around us, and not by my hand. A pep had stopped time, using the chute within Marcus. I shook my head, denying the information my eyes showed me was truth. A pep was possessing Marcus, absolutely and completely. A pep had full access to his power, and the only way to get him out of Marcus's body, the only way to give the universe any kind of a chance, was to kill Marcus. My stomach twisted, and my heart sank. How? The word was barely a whisper. Such a useless query, but I think I shall satisfy your curiosity anyway, a pep said, speaking with Marcus's lips and tongue, but sounding completely different from the man I loved. When you reunited the two fractured pieces of my chute during your little dalliance earlier, the power set held wasn't the only thing you pulled into your lover's body. A pep Marcus bowed his head to me. I thank you for the rather sudden relocation. He ran his hands down the front of Marcus's body. I do very much enjoy the way this one fits. And the power. He closed his eyes and groaned. To feel my shoot again, whole and throbbing with barely contained energy. I licked my lips, scanning the statue-like people all around me, like one of them might hold the key to regaining access to the exhausted chute within me. But all I found were faces locked in expressions of confusion and horror and shock, and the power remained unusable. A pep Marcus disappeared in an explosion of misty colors, before I could suck in a breath, before I could react at all, he reappeared behind me on the table. I spun around and stumbled backward, twisting my ankle as I slipped off the edge of the table. I landed in a heap on the floor and scrambled away from him. Grinning, he jumped off the table and stalked after me, his shoes silent on the polished floor. It really is a pity that tearing raws shoot out of you will destroy your body. I would have enjoyed playing with it, he sighed, and I continued to flee, running into immovable chairs and table legs and people. Vines of ought burst up from the floor, wrapping around my legs and ankles, working their way up my limbs. But now that the process has begun and you are fertile, we can't risk his eyes opened wide, and his words cut off abruptly at the exact same time as what felt like a vacuous gravitational field burst to life in my middle. It pulled at the chute so inextricably wound through my ba, tearing it away and consuming the power. I felt like I'd been doused in liquid nitrogen and was being shattered, and then I was on fire, flames consuming me from the inside out, I tried to scream, but I couldn't find my breath. At first, I thought it was a pep, ripping the chute out of my body, 
killing me in the most painful way possible, eviscerating my soul. But when Apep Marcus dropped to his knees before me, threw his head back, and roared in agony, I wasn't so sure. Around us, time stuttered, then resumed its usual passing with a thunderous explosion of sound. People were suddenly moving all around us, but the pain continued to sear through me. Somehow, I managed to suck in a breath, and finally, I screamed. Without warning, the agony ceased. I curled into the fetal position on the floor, a few feet away from Marcus's body. A pep Marcus was no longer crying out. He was no longer moving. He was no longer breathing at all. No, 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 no. I crawled closer to him and shook him by the shoulder, gently at first, then using more and more force as his chest refused to rise and fall, as his heart refused to beat, as his body refused to live. Nephi, I yelled. Aset, help him! I could hear people moving around me, heard Nephi curse at them as she pushed her way through the crowds of Nezirats, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from Marcus's face. It was absolutely devoid of any expression, because he was gone, dead. Someone grasped my shoulder and started pulling me backward. I twisted around to shove them away and found Ra Nikure's opalescent eyes only inches from my own. You must get away from him, Alexandra, he said. Now. No, I yanked my shoulder out of his hold and turned back to Marcus's body, just as an inky darkness started oozing out of his nose and mouth and ears. It headed straight toward me. A shimmering barrier of ought appeared right in front of my face, and not a second too late. A pep slammed into it, spreading in a writhing mass like he was searching for the barrier's edge, for a way around so he could get to me. Except there were no edges, as the last of the inky darkness left Marcus's body, Ra Nakure surrounded Apep completely with the aunt barrier, creating a floating, spherical prison large enough to hold several people and strong enough to contain the soul of a god. Slowly, the sphere shrunk, condensing the darkness inside. It grew deeper, denser, until an orb about the size of a baseball floated a few inches from my face, seeming to suck in the light around it. Marcus inhaled suddenly, just as Nephi slid to her knees beside him. His eyelids opened, and eyes of molten gold, not shimmering with divine power, skewered me. He was alive. Apep was gone, contained in the prison of solidified ought, and Apep's chute was, well, I didn't know where. At that moment, I didn't care. I threw myself on top of Marcus and sobbed against his neck. You came back. You came back, I cried over and over again. You were dead, but you came back to me. His arms encircled me, and his lips brushed feather-like kisses against my forehead and temple. He took hold of either side of my face and lifted my lips to his. Always, he murmured. I will always come back to you. Not even death could keep me away. My whole body was shaking. I don't understand what just happened. How you, a pep, he was possessing you, and then I clung to him. There was so much pain, and then you died. I just don't understand. I do, Ra Nakure said from behind me. Powerful new life forms within you, dear Alexandra. An irresistible host, or rather, hosts, for the shoots you both carried. Slowly, I pulled back from Marcus and looked over my shoulder at Ra Nakure. What? What? Congratulations to you both, he smiled and I didn't think I'd ever seen anyone look more pleased with himself. I'm sure you'll be wonderful 
parents. Chapter 49 Take and Give Sitting at the end of one of the longer ot tables, near the center of the dining hall, Nekure tilted his head to the side, listening to something nobody else could hear. With a nod, he looked at me. He says that you must have conceived when you, um... His eyes flicked to my parents, who were seated to my right, then to me and to Marcus, who was on my left. You know, earlier, underground, right after... Anyway, and he says that the sucking void you felt, followed by the burning sensation, was the two newly forming bas within you, absorbing the power. He was speaking for Ra, as wielding Nakure's shoot had exhausted the older being, and he could no longer maintain adequate control of Nakure's body. Once the chaos and confusion had settled, Marcus had ordered most of the Nezirats to either tend to their regular tasks around the underground oasis, or to venture above ground to deal with the approaching helicopter. Just a handful of my personal guards remained in the hall with us, along with my family and close Nezirat's friends, who were also seated around the rectangular table. Only Dominic was absent. As soon as Marcus had learned it had been set, who'd called to warn us of a pep's possession of Marcus, likely saving my life, he'd sent Dominic topside to await the helicopter's landing, and escort set down the tunnel into the oasis and to Nguyen's palace to join us. So, Nakure said, it looks like the process that'll restore Ma'at has really begun, and Apep. Nakure tossed the crystalline orb containing Apep's inky darkness into the air a few feet, catching it easily, is no longer a threat. He raised the orb in my direction, like he was toasting with a glass. Tiny guardians of Ma'at to our rescue, just in the nick of time. One pierced eyebrow arched higher. Remind me to thank the little monsters when they're old enough. Smiling and shaking my head, I gave Marcus's hand a squeeze under the table. It definitely hadn't sunk in yet that I was pregnant with twins, who were pretty much going to be gods. Nope, that hadn't sunk in at all, because when it did, I thought I'd probably faint. My mom shifted in her chair beside me, her attention on Nakure. Now, when you say monsters, do you mean that my grandchildren will be, um, inhuman? Nakure barked a laugh. Absolutely. Glancing at Jenny, who was seated across from me between Alexander and Grandma Suze, he added, Well, two of them, at least. We won't know whether Jenny's kid will manifest or not until the twins come into their power and get rid of the nothingness and return stability to the ought and all that, which should happen sometime around puberty or so Ra thinks. He flashed my mom a grin and widened his eyes like he was sharing some exciting news. We're in a bit of uncharted territory here. But anyway, you could end up the proud grandma of three inhuman beings. My mom blanched, bumping my shoulder against hers. I met her warm brown eyes. They'll be human enough, I assured her then felt some of the color drain from my own face. I didn't actually know, for sure. For all I knew, they might be just as incorporeal as Ra and Apep were in their natural state. Fear churned in my belly, solidifying into a heavy lump. I glanced at Nakure, and when he nodded, I forced a smile and met my mom's eyes. Promise. Do not fret, Alice, Asset said. You will find that a Nezure child with a shoot is much like any other baby. She flashed her son, 
an affectionate smile, though sometimes they prove to be a little more trouble, depending on what that shoot enables them to do. Nekure grinned. I sat back in my chair. The events of the past month, not to mention the past hour, finally starting to sink in. A relaxing combination of exhaustion and relief settled over me, overshadowing the rather hearty dose of anxiety I felt every time I thought about the divine lives taking shape within me, Marcus's and my children, and I sighed. We'd done it. We'd really done it. The universe wasn't going to unravel. My family and friends, everyone, weren't going to die or be unmade or whatever other unpleasant mode of destruction accompanied unraveling. We'd done it. Saved the world. And now, all I wanted was to sleep for about a month, safe and snug in Marcus's arms. Marcus's desires were apparently in tune with mine. Or possibly it was because our boss were so wholly entangled now. But he draped his arm over my shoulders, leaned in, and pressed his lips against my cheekbone. Let us retire, little Ivanov, little queen. I've always been a selfish man, and I find that I'm not in the mood for sharing you right now. He extended the wispiest tendril of his ba and caressed the outer edges of mine, and I drew in a shuddering breath. Heat suffused my cheeks, spread throughout my body, and made me desperate to be alone with him. I cleared my throat. Don't you think we should wait for Dom and Set to get down here? I glanced at the orb of seething obsidian. I mean, what if that's not all of a pep? Marcus pulled away, and he too sighed. It is, I assure you. But how do you know? Laughing bitterly, Marcus shook his head. Because Apep was so convinced of his triumph that he withheld nothing of himself, kept no part of his knowledge separate from me. So, believe me, Lex, I know. I bit my lip. Okay, I said, pushing my chair back to rise. I glanced at the faces of the people sitting around the table, the people I loved, and opened my mouth to excuse myself for the evening. A sharp crack boomed outside the palace, the reverberations echoing throughout the cavernous room. I stared at Marcus. Was that? Gunfire. He was suddenly on his feet as were the rest of us. Yes. By the time we reached the main bridge, crossing the canal to the tunnel side of the oasis cavern, two figures stumbled out of the tunnel's mouth. It was Set and Dominic, father and son, looking so strikingly similar. Dominic was leaning heavily on Set, his hand pressed against the lower portion of his ribcage, and his lips tinged red. Oh my God, Dom! I exclaimed as I lurched across the bridge ahead of the others and ran up the slightly winding, paved pathway toward them. I glanced over my shoulder to call for Nephi, but before I could even say her name, she rushed past me, right behind her father and Aset. I turned my attention back to Dominic. He and Set were less than a dozen paces ahead. What happened? I slowed as I took the final few steps. Who? How? Marcus reached them first, helping to ease Dominic down onto an intricately carved ot bench on the left side of the pathway. Who did this? He demanded, his focus intense on set. I did, Heru. It was an impossibly familiar voice, said from a ways up the pathway. I raised my head and stared at the two shadowed forms standing several hundred yards away in the mouth of the tunnel, and when my eyes confirmed what I'd heard, my mouth fell open. Carson? My graduate school peer standing in the ancient ancestral home of my non-human people was yet another impossible thing 
to add to those I seemed to make a habit of collecting. What? You? What are you doing here? He flashed his familiar boyish smile, but it appeared a little strained. I'd love to fill you in, Lex, some other time. I started shaking my head ever so slowly. Was it possible that he was Nejere? The implications? It didn't make sense. Cat was beside him. At first, I thought their arms were linked, like they'd been out for a friendly stroll. But then I realized that Carson's hand was gripping Cat's arm, just above the elbow. Focusing on Cat's face, I saw that tears dampened her cheeks and reddened her eyes. He shot Dom, she shrieked, and my mom's. Be quiet, Cat, Carson snapped. He lifted his other hand, and light from the LED cords lining the path glinted dully on dark metal. A handgun. He aimed it at Cat's head. Dom there tells me you've managed to trap a pep, Carson said. Give him to me, and I'll let sweet, innocent cat here live. He tilted his head to the side and jammed the nozzle of the gun against her temple. Don't, and, well, I'll start with cat. Then we'll see how many of you I can take out before you get to me. He grinned, that familiar boyish grin again, and I felt instantly ill. Carson, I took a step toward him, then another. Part of me felt certain that my eyes weren't seeing correctly, that my ears weren't hearing what my brain thought they were hearing, and another part of me felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Carson was one of the few people from my past, human life, who'd I considered a real friend. Was that all a lie? Was he an agent of Set, of Apep, like Mike had been? I'd been lied to and betrayed by a lot of people over the past year, but that didn't make Carson's betrayal any less shocking or painful. Why are you doing this? I asked, my voice sounding hollow as I continued my slow, stunned ascension up the pathway. His lips spread into a weak half-smile, a mere shadow of his usual grin, and he shook his head. You wouldn't understand. You swore an oath to me, Marcus said, appearing at my side. Carson shrugged. Some oaths supersede others. He twisted Kat's arm, making her cry out, and fixed his stare on Marcus and me. I'd stop there unless you want to see what the inside of a half-manifested Nejeret's brain looks like. And I rather like her, so I'd appreciate it if you didn't force my hand. Marcus and I stopped immediately, neither of us willing to risk Cat's life in a game of chicken. Who are you working for? Marcus demanded. Frowning, Carson stared up at the cavern's ought ceiling like he was thinking exceptionally hard. I suppose there's no harm in telling you now. When his eyes once again focused on Marcus, he grinned. We call ourselves the kin. I was having such a hard time reconciling my memory of the young archaeologist I'd known back in Seattle with this seemingly unstable and undeniably homicidal Nejere that his words barely registered. Whose kin? Marcus asked. Carson's grin widened. The kin. I'm sure you'll hear more about us soon. I frowned. The kin? I could practically feel the rage crackling around Marcus. What do they want with a pip? Carson shrugged. I only know what my mission is, not why I was assigned it. His eyes flicked to some point beyond us and I heard footsteps behind me. I risked the briefest glance over my shoulder and saw Nikure making his way up the pathway ever so slowly. He held a Pep's small, spherical prison up and gave it a little shake. Let the girl start walking this way and I'll throw it to you. Eyes wide, 
I stared at Nakure. Was he really considering handing Apep over after everything we'd done to trap him? But the more I considered it, the more I understood his reasoning, and the more I agreed with his decision, it didn't matter who actually had possession of the Apep orb because only three living beings could free him, Nikure and my unborn children. Carson shook his head. Throw it to her, he said to Nakure, and I swear I'll let her go. Your words are worthless, Marcus said, his voice low and cold. You're proving that right now. Carson shrugged. That is a matter of perspective. I met Nakure's eyes, while Marcus traded barbs with Carson and, as quietly as possible, said, can you do anything from here? Nakure shook his head, which meant Carson was too far away for him to use his chute to do anything to stop the younger Nejere. And as far as I could tell, I no longer had access to Ra's chute at all, so I couldn't do anything, which meant there was only one way out of this new tangle that didn't include anyone else getting hurt. Not that I would have minded Carson suffering a bit, but still. You'll let her go? I asked Carson. You promise? He nodded. Once I have a pep, I'll keep Cat with me as collateral. When we get to the helicopter, it's her choice whether she stays with me or returns here. He paused, then added, Either way, she'll be unharmed. I eyed him. Then Cat, who looked absolutely miserable and utterly terrified, and why would she ever choose to go with you? Because her mother is waiting for me back in the helicopter, making sure the pilot remains obedient. One glance at Cat told me his words were true, and I knew, with absolute certainty, that he wouldn't hurt Cat, unless he had to. Not if he was working with Jen, whatever her faults. Genevieve Dubois loved her daughter very much. Fine, I said with a nod. Do it, Nikure. Give him the orb. Marcus slipped his hand in mine and squeezed, all the while glaring at Carson. If you go back on your word, he said, if you harm her, we will hunt you down and make you beg for death. But we will not grant you the release of death, Set said as he took up a post between Nikure and me. Not for years. And when we do, Nikure added, your death will come in the form of a prison of aught, slowly crushing you until you are no larger than this. He lobbed the orb containing a pep toward Cat, who caught it with a slight fumble. Concern, or possibly fear, flashed across Carson's face, and he licked his lips. Understood he said, with a nod and started backing deeper into the tunnel. Don't follow us. Cat, a set called from beside Marcus. I hadn't heard her approach, but there she stood. I'm sure your mother must love you very much, but know that we do too. She is not the only family you have. Remember that when you make your choice. I thought Cat nodded, before the darkness swallowed her completely, but it might have been a trick of the eyes. Poor child, Aset said. She cared for him a great deal. I think she may even have loved him. Such a betrayal. I stared at her, stunned for about the millionth time that day. What? Nakure grunted and crossed his arms. It was merely an infatuation. She'll get over it. I frowned up at the empty tunnel. So much has changed. Indeed, little Ivanov, Marcus said, rubbing his thumb over the back of my hand. Indeed. Chapter 50 Now and Always 
I'm glad you chose to stay, I told Kat. It was the middle of the night, and we were sitting at Dominic's bedside, in his room on the second floor of the Heru Palace, watching his chest rise and fall while his body healed the hole in his lung. He looked older and thinner, but he was alive, thanks to a combination of Nephi and Asset's medical skills and Dominic's own regenerative Nejere abilities. It wasn't really much of a choice, Kat said. She bit her lip and shot me a sideways glance. I mean, not really. My mom, I don't know what's going on with her. It's like she's been brainwashed or something, and then Carson? She swallowed roughly and looked away, staring at Dominic's shoulder. Her chin trembled. I hate him. If I ever see him again. She squeezed her eyes shut, and several fat tears broke free, gliding down her cheek. I never want to see him again. Shaking my head, I reached for her hand. I'm so sorry, Kat. What he did was awful. Unforgivable, I know. But your mom... I shrugged. Maybe there's still hope for her. She glanced at me. You think? I honestly don't know. But I promise we'll do what we can to figure it out. That we will, Marcus said from the arched doorway. I looked up to find him and Set walking into the room, one after the other, and felt the oddest sense of deja vu. It seems so strange to see you both here, but so normal at the same time. I laughed softly as I gave Kat's hand a squeeze and released it, before standing and walking into Marcus's open, waiting arms. If not for your clothes, I might believe I'd traveled back in time again. I smiled against his shirt. I kind of miss the kilts. Marcus chuckled. I must admit that I miss seeing you dressed in the attire of that time as well. Set cleared his throat, and my cheeks heated instantly. I peeked at him, offering him a small smile. I'm pooped. You'll sit with them for a bit. He nodded. I don't need a babysitter, Kat said. I'm perfectly capable of watching Dom do nothing all by myself. I have no doubt of that, Set said. He sat in the chair I'd vacated. But a father. Now that is another matter entirely. I smiled up at Marcus as he guided me out of the room with an arm wrapped around my shoulders. He led me to the bedroom that had been mine during the weeks I'd spent living in this house so long ago and shut a very modern-looking odd door. I studied the door for a moment. Nakure? I asked Marcus. He nodded. He's been making his way through the palaces, fixing them up the best he can so our people can start living in them again if they so choose. Glancing around the room, taking in the ancient, familiar art furnishings and scattered, modern elements, I smiled. You've been staying in here, haven't you? Again, Marcus nodded. But you didn't know it was my room. Not really. Moving in front of me, he ran his hands up my arms, over my shoulders, and trailed his fingertips up the sides of my neck. No, I didn't know. He leaned in, brushing his lips first over one cheek, then the other. But I felt you here, little Ivanov. This was the only place besides your sanctuary where I felt closer to you, when I doubted that you'd ever find your way back to me. I gripped the belt loops at his sides, and pulled his body flush against mine. But I did find my way back to you. I'll always find my way back to you. Promise me. My eyebrows drew together, and I tilted my head to the side, my lips curving into a faint smile. Promise you? Swear to me that you'll always come back. Always. His eyes so golden and heated, held nothing but demands. So many demands. But I can't travel through time anymore, I said, shaking my head. Just a plain old Nazareth. Why? 
Just promise me, he demanded. I frowned, but I also gave him what he wanted, even if I didn't understand why he was so desperate for such an unnecessary promise. I swear it, I said. I will always come back to you. And as I made the promise, some deep part of my mind wondered if maybe he knew something I didn't, if maybe I'd locked away more memories within his mind from more time periods than even I knew about. I wondered if maybe my stint as a time traveler wasn't actually over. When Marcus's lips touched mine, when he swept me into his arms and carried me to the bed, when he removed my clothing piece by piece, I seared the promise I'd made him into my soul. Whatever happens, I will always find my way back to this man. Always. Thanks for listening. You've reached the end of Time Anomaly, Echo Trilogy Part 2. But Lex's adventures continue in Dissonance, Echo Trilogy Part 2.5, and Ricochet Through Time, Echo Trilogy Part 3. And if you haven't already, make sure to grab your free copy of Resonance, Echo Trilogy Part 1.5. This has been Time Anomaly, Echo Trilogy, Book Two, written by Lindsay Sparks, writing as Lindsay Fairley, narrated by Dana Day. Text copyright 2015 by Rubis Press. Production copyright 2018 by Rubis Press. All rights reserved.